All right, everyone. Thank you for coming to our first virtual meeting of the Litchfield JAR Civil, Civil War Roundtable. As you can see, I'm in the hall. You guys can remember what it looked like. Um, we're <laughs> obviously hoping to get everyone back in this building as soon as possible, but the plan for the foreseeable future is to host these meetings virtually um, until either the governor allows us to meet again in person or the case counts in the area reduce. But watch your emails, um, watch the news briefings from the state. We're just gonna go with the flow. So a couple of announcements. Um, our January Civil War Roundtable is going to meet on Saturday, January 9th. It will not be on the second Thursday. It's going to be Saturday, January 9th. Um, our speaker had to reschedule. And since we, we were going to be meeting virtually anyway, um, we made it work. Um, Adam Katz, who's a previous speaker with the Litch at the Litchfield Roundtable, he's going to be presenting on baseball during the Civil War. A, um, a topic that he's really excited about. And so I think you'll have a lot of fun with it. Um, the 2021 schedule is a little bit in flux at the moment because um, presenters are asking to rework how they present or they're asking to reschedule. So it's not, it was ready, but now it needs to be reworked, but I'll get that to you all as soon as, as, soon as it's finished. Um, um, just some te technical announcements. Um, if you allow your computer just to sit still, it might go to sleep. And if that happens, you'll be taken out of the Zoom meeting. So just wiggle your mouse every like 10 minutes or so, or um, it, it'll be fine. Um, please keep, all of, all of your mics are already muted, which is perfect. Um, please keep them so while George is talking. And then when he's finished, you can unmute and ask a lot of questions and we'll have one a, another good conversation like we usually do at near the end of our meetings um and i just like to say personally you know we love putting on the round table and we will do it in any capacity that we can but it does come at a cost to the museum so if um, i'm going to put a link to the museum's page on give minnesota if you could please take a minute to um, make a donation to the museum so we continue we can continue to pay for these speakers and put on the meetings throughout the year that'd be really appreciated so without further ado our speaker today is george romano george has had an interest in the civil war since growing up 20 minutes away from the chickamauga battlefield site in northwest georgia he is a past president of the Rochester Civil War Roundtable and the past president of the board of the Lakewood Battlefield Preservation Association. That organization is dedicated to preserving and commemorating the 1862 Dakota War Wood Lake Battlefield site near Granite Falls. He's an annual speaker at the Rochester Civil War Roundtable. George has also been a guest presenter at other roundtables in Winona, with Shaska, Mankato, New Ulm, St. Cloud, Stillwater, and of course, Litchfield. I'd like to thank George for, for accommodating us today, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. So without further ado, Mr. George Romano. Yay! <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. As, as, as I just said a little while ago, I, there's, I would rather, much rather be <laughs> In the in the GR hall with all your smiling faces in front of me, that's not going to happen. Uh, most of the time when I've been speaking, I prefer people just to ask questions as they occur to them as I'm speaking, and that's probably not going to happen either. So if you have questions based on something that is coming up in the slides or something I've said, try to just note that down, jot it down somewhere, and then at the end of the presentation. We'll just try to revisit because I'll keep the I'll keep the presentation up, and we'll just kind of try to find that slide, and we'll answer the question then. So it's it's I'd rather be interrupted by a question, but it's just the way because of the way logistics of Zoom, it's just going to be difficult to do that. So please, I'd like you to ask questions. It really makes it a much more uh, a better experience as a speaker and as an educational experience if you can ask questions. It's just that it may be just difficult to stop and and uh, ask questions in the middle of presentation write them down or there's a, a a chat thing you can try to type them in there but we'll just keep going through the whole presentation 
So the topic for this afternoon is, is the great locomotive chase. And it wasn't called that in the time that it had happened. It was called the train stealing or the great train, train theft. It wasn't until much, much later after the Civil War that they got sort of renamed the Great Locomotive Chase. And believe it or not, there's actually a locomotive chase that takes place as part of this whole incident. But the thing I've kind of learned from getting into this and, and researching a little bit and reading at least a three or four books about it, it's less than meets the eye. So sometimes history does that. You, you're looking at some topic and you realize, wow, there's a lot about this I didn't understand or I didn't know. And I think for the locomotive chase, for me anyway, the more I looked into it, the more I thought, well, is that it? Is there, is there, isn't there more? And I'll kind of express that a little bit as I go through this. So we have a lot to cover, even if that's true, but you'll see that it's in a way a small event and the chase itself doesn't last that long. So we'll try to, I'll try to explain what I mean by that. So to understand why the chase happened, and it is an odd thing, think about this. When would two locomotives in the history of mankind and locomotives ever chase each other? I mean, they might be trying to set some kind of record, some kind of speed thing maybe, or a challenge or whatever, but really, when would a locomotive chase another locomotive at top speeds? For what reason? Why would they do it? So in a way, this part of that present, this presentation is unique in history. I don't think it's ever happened before then. Maybe it has, I don't know. And I'm pretty sure it never has happened since. So in that way, this great locomotive chase is a historical singularity. Two locomotives, one chasing the other at top speed through the, the, the back hills of, uh, of, of Northwest Georgia. And why did that happen? How did it happen and what happened as a result? is what the presentation you're gonna hear is about. So how did it happen? How did, it, how did this thing ever, ever happen in the first place? Well, to understand that, you have to understand what was happening in April of 1862. Well, the war had been on for almost a year by this time, but April, and actually it was March and April, was the first real campaign in terms of an invasion, a serious invasion. And that was Grant coming down through Kentucky and then into Tennessee, to invade the Confederacy. And it was, you know, everyone's sort of on you know, the Civil War, they was sort of picking up and learning as you went. Really, people really didn't know how to run a campaign or an invasion for that matter. So you can see from the map that what was going on is the two pushes, one coming down and, to, and they, would, they would meet up at, at the Confederate forces at Shiloh. Now Shiloh was April 6th, and it just had just happened when the other events that I'm gonna describe occurred. So that evening, the, the first day of Shiloh, effectively the Union loses the battle, and then the next day they win it. So that's effectively how the April 6th and 7th went. But that had not quite happened yet. So another less known thing that was going on was a separate force under this guy, General, G General Ormsby M. Mitchell, and his force was kind of to the west of that. So he was advancing into Mur Nashville, they captured Nashville, Murfreesboro, and Shelbyville, and he was in Shelbyville and <clears throat> planning to invade Huntsville. Now, this was not part of Grant's main force. It was sort of like on the side, sort of like covering his flank, if you want to think of it that way. He was going to take Huntsville because there was a rail line there. And if he caught that rail line, you can kind of see that cuts the, basically the rail system in the south in half, if he can take that rail line near Huntsville. But he wanted to do more than that. He wanted to get Chattanooga. Chattanooga was the prize. If you get Chattanooga, basically you, you sort of like got a stranglehold on all the rail lines in, in, the, in the South. So why was rail so important? Well, railroads, this Civil War was the first real railroad war. Uh, rails had railroads had existed for almost 50 years prior to the Civil War, but it was the, the, the Civil War that actually became where, where rails became strategic and how the war was fought. fought. And for what you would think, because there is equipment to move, a lot of people to move, ammunition, cannons, even horses. They were a lot better off if they could be moved by rail. They could move them faster and they were more dependable in terms of the road system, which was atrocious. The road system in the United States was horrifyingly bad, and especially in when the weather was bad. Of course, they were advancing towards the end of the winter. And as I got farther south, the weather got better, but it was still, it was still impassable. The roads were still impassable. So if they could get the railroads, they could basically take the south. And so just to mention a couple of facts about that, 
when the Civil War began, the United States, even though railroads, railroads hadn't been around that long, had more laid track than all the other countries in the world combined because our country was just suited for railroads. It, it just it was perfect. There wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of, um, a lot of times where railroads were built, there really wasn't any settlement or any people anyway. They didn't have to take up farmland or roads or cities because they were basically building rails where there was nothing already. So all the, the entire world combined, there was less more rail laid in the United States uh, than any other, you know, than any other place in the world. Um, of that, two thirds of that rail line was north of what you would call the Mason-Dixon line in the north, northeast and Midwest. And Midwest was just starting to become a, a rail hub. So the South had far fewer rail lines, um, which made them that much more important if you could get them. So if you could capture the rail lines or break them or, or, or get the terminuses where they joined together, it was even that much more important in the South because there was no other, you can kind of see from the map, if you cut those, a few of those rail lines in certain spots, you can't, there's no rail to go around. There's no way to work around where, where you might be, where you might have put, put your choke point. Uh, the other thing is that the rail lines in the South were newer, which was good, but they were also less well run. So they didn't have as nearly amount of equipment, they didn't have as nearly much as much in terms of steam engines to, to drive the, 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 uh, the rail. Plus they didn't have near as many uh, running rolling stock cars or whatever you think that you put in a in you know that you use to transport stuff transport stuff with a rail line the south didn't have nearly as much of that equipment so if you get that it was that much more important because since there wasn't a whole lot of it if you got any of it it was it was going to be a, a a big deal so the other thing about rail lines is bridges so we're going to just talk about that in a minute here but let's talk about this guy Ormsby Mitchell because he himself is an interesting guy Without Ormsby Mitchell, there would never have been a, a, a great locomotive chase and never would have been a raid. So why Mitchell? Well, uh, Mitchell, his background, he's, he's a Kentuckian. He went to West Point in, in class of West Point in 1929. Now that he had a very famous, or turns out to be a famous classmate, and that's Robert E. Lee. So that was Robert E. Lee's uh, West Point class. Now, I don't know how well Lee did at West Point, but Mitchell did very well. He was 16th in his class, but his he had a really um, interesting uh, talent for mathematics. In fact, he was kept at West Point after his graduation for three years as a mathematics instructor. Uh, the other thing about uh, Mitchell, it just speaks for his intelligence. He became a lawyer during that time, so he passed the bar. He, was, he worked as a surveyor, surveyor and a railroad and civil engineer. So he actually built railroad tracks. He understood how railroads, railroads worked, how, how, them, how to actually build them. Uh, and, but his love of life was he was an astronomer. So his nickname was Old Stars, not because he was a general, because he liked astronomy. So they call him Old Stars because he was always talking about astronomy. In fact, one of Mitchell's legacies was he built the first real observatory in the United States of America. And when he got that built, he had the second largest telescope in the world installed there. Um, and that, that telescope is still in use today, believe it or not. So it's, it's, it's quite an accomplishment. He's a really accomplished person, had to be very intelligent, but he's finally, he's in charge of the forces that are there in, in Shelbyville actually, you know, right where that map shows. And he's trying to figure out, oh, and another thing I'd add is, you know, Lee became a much better, more famous general than Mitchell did, but Mitchell has a crater named after him on Mars and Lee does not. So there you go, so there. So. There's something to to uh, to, to Shelby to Orange B. Mitchell that that Lee, uh, Robert E. Lee cannot claim, but uh, he has to, he wants to basically take Chattanooga, and so what he's looking at he's looking at the same map you see there, and he's thinking, well, if I could break that supply line that comes out from Atlanta, and I can take Chattanooga, then the forces I'd be fighting can't be in supply. So, so the it was actually Baxton Bragg is that 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 gray box is right there next to the on the map where it says Chattanooga. By the way, Cleveland, Tennessee is where I grew up, right to, to the to the the right. Of, so Cleveland, Tennessee is where is is, is twenty you know, away from Chattanooga. But um, uh, he could he can if he can cut that supply line now. No matter since all the 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 tracks were you know there's just iron rails laid on wooden ties and a lot of bridges there are a lot of wooden bridges as well um, anything you could do at a railroad track could just be rebuilt later but for a certain period of time whatever force you would be facing if you could cut off their supply behind them basically that rail that line that ran from 
Atlanta to Chattanooga, they were cut off from their supplies. Now there were roads and wagons and things like that, but there's no way that you could have an army very large and have trying to supply them, at least in the springtime in that part of Georgia, the, the roads were bad. So Mitchell's thinking, well, how could we cut that rail line, the line between Chattanooga and Atlanta? How would that, how would it possibly work? Well, let's look, look and see what was there. So was, this is what it looked like. So that was the Western and Atlantic Railroad. So now this is a little bit closer and you can kind of see, this is the, this is the map is where most of the uh, events that I'm gonna be taking uh, that we're, we're gonna be discussing this afternoon took place. And Atlanta's down there in the lower right corner. And then up in the upper left corner is Chattanooga. And the Western and Atlantic Railway was the railroad that ran, ran from Atlanta to Chattanooga. And um, the idea then was if we could burn the bridges or somehow disrupt that rail line, then the forces in Chattanooga, Baxter and Bragg's forces in Chattanooga would be out of supply. Uh, even if it was only for like weeks or a month, that was still a significant amount of time that he wouldn't be able to supply his, his army. So we could take Chattanooga. And if you take Chattanooga, it doesn't matter about Atlanta or anything actually, because you, you cut off all the, the north, all the um, north-south traffic and you cut off all the east-west traffic in terms of the Confederacy rail lines. So Chattanooga was big. And if it could get to that rail line, the Western and Atlantic Railway basically just disrupted somehow. It, temporary, just burning a bridge, I could cut off Bragg. And that's where this all, this, all, this all started, is Mitchell's thinking, well, is there a way that I could get that done? So he's puzzling over this and who steps into his office? But yeah, fate would have it. Now, this is all happening on you know, April 6th and 7th, just as the Battle of Shiloh is taking place, but this character. And that's where the this whole thing starts. James J. Andrews. Now, who is James J. Andrews? Why is he walking into Mitchell's headquarters? Well, he's walking into Mitchell's headquarters because Mitchell's commander, which is uh, Carlos Buell, uh, North burn bridges, basically disrupt that Western and Atlantic Railway. Now, why did, first of all, how did he end up in, in the office of, 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 uh, of Mitchell? Well, because he had actually attempted this already. This, this Andrews raid with the Great Locomotive Chase was actually his second attempt to do this. So Andrews was this guy, and he's kind of like a shady character. There's a lot about him that people don't know. Like, his name is J.J. Andrews, but no one knows what the J ever stood for. They couldn't find it. And somebody actually went to try to find his birth records, and he was born in actually what is now West Virginia. There is no birth records for anybody named James J. Andrews born on that in that time, the year and time that he said he was born. So there's some mysteries about James J. Andrews that no one will ever be able to figure out. But James J. Andrews was by reputation, we'll say not a spy, but let's say that he worked both sides of the fence. So this is early in the war. And if you think about how this worked, there were no like borders. There was no barbed wire fence. There was no pickets that would challenge you if you're going from north to south or east to west for that matter. So you could sort of move as much as you wanted to between north and south, at least then. And unless uh, there was some local militia or somebody that challenged you, there was no, there's no border, there's no barrier. In fact, you could get on a train and take the train from from wherever you started in the north and end up in a, in a station in the south. Who would stop you? Now, occasionally people would board those trains. There'd be constables and sheriffs and things like that, finding out and trying to find out um, who was on the train, but it was never organized. There was never any real system of, of papers or ID cards or anything like that. People just moved about as they might. And unless they were challenged, they could get away with it. And Andrews got away with it. So what he was doing was basically running, not like a blockade runner, but more like running supplies from the north to the south where things were short, uh, certain items were short, and then from the south to the north. So he was basically on both sides of the line. Now, there's nowhere that anybody would be able to tell you that he was some kind of loyalist to the union cause. In fact, people say basically his cause was Andrews himself. <laughs> and there was, it was kind of an odd thing that he wanted to do this raid at all. The raid he done for Buell is they took, he took seven volunteers uh, under Buell's 
you know, uh, approval. And they went south to, uh, to Atlanta. Um, they were going to basically steal a train. The, the thing that Andrews overlooked is he was supposedly going to meet up with an engineer that could drive the train. And it turned out that that engineer was transferred to some other railroad that, you know, that week or whatever. So the engineer wasn't there. And of course, he didn't bring anybody else that could drive a train. So the raid sort of ended right there. They all sort of broke up and went back. So that was his first attempt. Wasn't a good one. So Beale said, okay, I'm, you know, I'm tired of this kind of thing. Uh, Mitchell's the one that wants to invade Chattanooga. Why don't you go talk to Mitchell? So that's how Andrews ends up going to Mitchell's office with a recommend, letter of recommendation from Carlos Buell, his, his commanding officer. So he comes like, not necessarily highly recommended, but he, he's not a total stranger. So we never really know what the conversation was between Mitchell and Andrews. So the thing about Mitchell I didn't tell you about, Mitchell ends up taking whatever conversation or whatever arrangements he made to his grave because he dies of yellow fever. Mitchell dies of yellow fever in September of 62. He never writes about this meeting in his memoirs. He certainly must have met with Andrews because of the events that were going to happen shortly, but uh, <laughs> no one really knows in a way why Mitchell wanted to do this, except of course the railroad, cutting the rail lines, and nobody knows like what Andrews was going to get out of it because he certainly wouldn't have been able to, you know, once he, if he failed at this mission, he was gonna be in trouble. And if he succeeded, he'd have notoriety. And if you're playing both sides of the line in, in a war or, or trying to trade on both sides of the line, notoriety is not a good thing. You don't wanna be well-known. You wanna be sort of a unknown. And he was gonna lose that ability. So what the sort of estimation is, is that maybe, maybe, that, Mitch, that uh, Andrews was gonna get paid for this. There was some money that somehow Mitchell was gonna acquire and he promised Andrews, if you pull this off, you get so much in gold or something like that. So again, no one really knows why Andrews did all of what he did or why he was so intent on doing this, except he was, there was possibly some award or reward, or maybe he was just thinking, I'd be so famous and, and I'll be able to, you know, I won't have to buy a beer the rest of my life kind of thing, who knows? No one really knows what his motivations were because you, as you'll find out, Andrews didn't have a lot long to go either. So what Mitchell did is he decides, okay, we're gonna get some support for Andrews. Andrews this time says, well, I wanna take 24 men with me. So he tells Mitchell, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to handpick these 24 men and at least four of them have to have some experience driving a train. So you'd think, well, that's not, is that easy to do or not? But apparently um, this was like the uh, Mitchell's um, regiments were from the Southeast part of Ohio. Mitchell was actually living in Ohio when the Civil War started because of where the observatory was in Cincinnati. So Mitchell became a general of these Ohio regiments, the Southeast Ohio. And apparently enough people were in these regiments that he could find four of those people that had some experience as engineers. And, of course, you'd imagine, you know, this, these were volunteers. Now, this was, there was no, uh, uh, there was no uh, draft in, in the North at this time. So they were all volunteers. Um, all of them, by the way, all these Ohioans had actually enlisted that when the regiments formed in, uh, in uh, October of uh, uh, 1860. So they had been in the army about, figure about six months, maybe seven months. None of them, none of these regiments under the command of Mitchell had any combat experience at all. So these, these, these young men that were, going, that were going to be handpicked, or I think he was asking, some regiments asked for volunteers sometimes, and some of the regiments, they just went out and picked them. They just picked these people out of some other line. How they picked them, nobody knows, but they got picked. So they handpicked these 24 volunteers, and they do have their four that have some rail driving or, or engine driving experience, and they meet... Andrews for the first time. Now, this is April 7th. This is the second day of the Battle of Shiloh. Now, no one knows what happened at Shiloh yet because the you know, news had not got out yet. But Andrews gets some money because he, he gives all the men some money. This is basically buy a civilian clothes and a pistol and ammunition because I want you to volunteer to be, to, to be a part of the secret mission I'm going to take down into the South. Now, he doesn't say where they're going. He doesn't say what they're going to do. And again, April 7th. So they handpicked them on the 6th when they, well, after Andrews meets with Mitchell. They meet for the first time on the 7th. Now, the thing to understand is these men, these 24 men, don't know each other. They have never been in combat before. Now, they probably had some drill and rifle experience because 
they had been in the army six months, you know, and then they did have uniforms. So, I mean, there was an organized force they were part of, but they had no combat experience. And the other odd thing is there wasn't an officer amongst them. So the highest ranking volunteer was a staff sergeant, which is pretty high in terms of an enlisted man. Uh, most were privates. Um, the average age was 23, as you would expect, because they're just picking these out of a, this, this new, these newly formed regiments. And um, the thing about Andrews, what made him different is he was tall, very tall, very dark, striking hair. By the way, that photograph is showing up on the slide. Someone's disputed that's even a picture of Andrews at all. <laughs> so that's even, that's even more mystery to this, that that's not his real picture. But, you know, that's the picture that's shown as this is Andrew's picture, so everyone uses it. But this guy is saying, no, it's not his picture at all. But anyway, uh, part of the, but he was a good talker. So he had a, a way about them. You'd have to think if you were running both sides of the fence, as it were, and basically he was also trading information, not just goods, but information on both sides of the fence. Uh, you'd have to be a good talker. You'd have to have some amount of confidence in your only ability, your ability to talk your way in and out of anything that, you know, that if you were challenged and he was basically probably good at this. So, you know, he, he did this thing, you know, and if we were making a movie about the Andrews raid, this would be a dramatic moment and very dramatic because there's a thunderstorm coming in the background. By the way, this was the start of some rain that rained for two weeks starting at this meeting, but, um, and he's giving this speech and he's basically saying, you know, uh, if any of you men don't want to be part of this, you know, daredevil meet this thing, then there's a risk that you could be killed and, uh, you know, you can leave now and no one will ever question your, your courage, you know, that type of thing. Of course, none of them left, you know, that's, it, it's a typical thing in all those, those, you know, sort of pep talks, you know, you, you can leave now and no one will ever question, you know, your, why you left, but the, none of them left. So they're all part of this thing. Now they get their supplies and they head south. So the other thing to emphasize is not that they not know each other. There was no like training or uh, any kind of bonding exercise or anything like that. They were just 24 handpicked guys and Andrews. And he said, basically, oh, actually one of them was not, one of the, the other guys was, it was another civilian that was picked as well, but uh, uh, who had a very unsavory reputation, by the way, they say he was on the land for murder. <laughs> But they all just basically met up on April 8th and they said, okay, Andrew says, we're all going to go south. We're going to break into small groups. We're going to walk. They were on foot until we get to Chattanooga and cross, basically crossing the Confederate lines, if you want to view it that way. Then we'll take a train to it to, to a, near Atlanta. And he gave them all their, you know, gave them some money so that, you know, Confederate money so they could buy their plane, train tickets and some food you know, on their way down there. Um, now, the other guy that shows up on the slide, his name is Corporal William Pettinger. Pettinger. And the thing about Pittenger, the reason I have to call him out now is because where I'm describing things that happened, meetings that took place, what Andrew said, it was Pittenger who wrote it all down. He was one of the volunteers. He was a school teacher in, in one of the Ohio regiments, handpicked. Now, again, why they picked Pittenger, God only knows, but he was picked. Uh, nearsighted, so he always just depicted wearing glasses. Uh, Pittenger wrote a book, and the book is called Daring and Suffering. You can still get that book online today. You can get it at, at uh, uh, Amazon. And basically, it's also published in the public domain. So if you ever heard of Gutenberg Press, you can get a copy of, of Daring and Suffering there. Now, the way I describe Daring and Suffering is it's a very accurate, in fact, the book that everyone who ever writes a book about the Andrews Raid uses, because he wrote this book almost immediately after he was released from captivity. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute, after a while. But um, it was very accurate. And he doesn't basically, he doesn't exaggerate his own role or the role of anybody else. So he's very, very humble in how he writes about these events. But the reason you have to call him out when you do a presentation about this is if you, if, if you say that, you know, Andrew said this and then they did this and here's what happened. It was Pettinger's account that everyone's using and we really owe them a debt of gratitude that he wrote it all down. So Corporal William Pettinger, and he's not, he'll appear in our story again here. So the Raiders head south. And they're going to actually go to Marietta, Marietta, Georgia. And as they go south, this is kind of weird, they get lost. <laughs> and it's raining and, you know, they're traveling. They're trying to stay out of sight. And not out of sight like hide, but out of sight in that they don't want to be noticed. So, again, you can walk basically to Marietta, Georgia if you want to, or to actually Chattanooga. There's no picket line. There's no guardhouse that you go past where you show them some kind of papers. You just walk there. But they got lost. And finally, they meet up with Andrews. And he's also walking on the way down. Um, 
and they're complaining. They're saying, well, you know, we're wet, we're tired, we're hungry. We don't know what we're doing. Now they have civilian clothes and they have their pistols. So then they're not totally lost. But Andrew says, okay, come on, just come with me. We'll all go in one big group. So here was all of this great plan about we're all going to show up at different times. Now, not all of them are there. Some of them are still on their own, but most of them are in this big group of young men of, of uh, a certain age. Now they, they have their pistols like hidden in their coats and their and sacks or whatever. Um, but they're all moving now one big group. So because of all this, them getting lost and then found again, it delays the start of their operation. So they were supposed to start this raid on the 11th of April. Now think about it. They meet for the first time on the 7th. They get their supplies on the 8th. They head down there and they were supposed to get there on the 11th and hold the, and do the raid. That's how, the, how fast this was. These men didn't know each other. They didn't really know what the, when they were, the plan was yet. So they get down there. Um, on the 11th, and Andrew says, well, we're going to delay one day because it, it was too hard to get down. They just couldn't all get down to that hotel at the same time. So we're going to go for the 12th. So that's how the raid ends up on the 12th because they couldn't make it on the 11th. Unfortunately, the raid was supposed to be coordinated with Mitchell's push to Cape Chattanooga. And because they delayed that one day, they, they couldn't tell Mitchell that, that, that there was a delay. Mitchell goes ahead and, and basically attacks Huntsville, Alabama, and Chattanooga on the 11th, like he had originally planned. That's a day ahead of the time when the raid is going to take place. So that sort of messes things up a little bit. So that sets the stage. That's how, they, how the raid gets basically paid for and scheduled and planned. Andrews is the one that plans it all. Um, Mitchell is the one that basically supports it all. And the volunteers are just picked out of these regiments. And there they all end up in Marietta, Georgia. It's kind of a weird story, but that's, that's the way it was. <clears throat> okay, so now this is what the, the day of the raid. It was supposed to be Friday, and it ends up having to be Saturday. So that's the only reason it's on April 12th, is because they couldn't get it dragged together on the 11th. So the way this happens is Saturday morning, Mitchell, they all, um, not Mitchell, but um, uh, Andrews and, and the Raiders, they all stay, except um, 20 of them end up in this hotel in Marietta, Georgia. They stay overnight. Now, they don't get a very good night's sleep because they have to be up at 3 a.m. to catch the train they need to steal. So, you know, you can imagine a young man, now they're all behind enemy lines. They have never been, none of them have ever been to Georgia before, much less out of Ohio. <laughs> they had never been to Tennessee before when they were in, in, there as well. So they have no idea in a way where they are. They have now by this time figured out they're gonna steal a train, um, but four of them are missing. So of the four that are missing, Two of them just got lost on the way down and they ended up being waylaid by a Georgia regiment and they were forced to join the regiment. So that was one of the plans. If you get caught and you can't talk your way out of it, just tell them that you're looking to join a regiment. And of course, there's no, not to prove who you are except your name, um, give them some story. And then when you could, after joining the regiment at some amount of time in the future, escape, just, you know, when you get close to enemy, uh, to the Union lines, just walk away and, and you know desert and, and cross back to your your side. Well, two of them actually had to do that, and which was really in a way pretty harrowing. But you imagine they didn't slip up. You know they stuck to their story, and so two of them end up in a Georgia regiment. Both of them, by the way, did end up escaping eventually and going back to Union lines, just like they were told to do. So they actually made it back. You know they weren't part of the raid at all. And in fact, they had been in, they had to be in the Georgia Army for like two or three months, but they were able to get away. So it's good. Two of them stayed at a different hotel. Now, how they got in the wrong hotel, I don't know, but they did. So um, this is the map, by the way. So we'll, we'll follow the, the progress. Now, we're heading north because we're stealing the train down south, and we're going up to Chattanooga. You can kind of see Chattanooga in the upper corner, Atlanta in the lower corner. Um, so the idea is they're in Marietta. You can kind of see that that's there. Um, that's where the hotel is, where they all meet up, pretty far south. Um, Marietta, well, it's, it's 138 miles uh, by train from Atlanta, where the general actually starts out, where the train actually starts out, to Chattanooga. So it's pretty far, not real far, but it's pretty far. It's certainly too far to walk. So 138 miles you know, covered on this map here. Um, it would take a train normally about 12 hours to, take, to go from Atlanta to Chattanooga. Now that's at what we call a, the, the road speed. So the, the railroad has single track with sidings and the idea behind owning a railroad is you wanted to have as much traffic on that road as possible because the more you use the road, they usually they're privately owned, the more money you can make out of 
owning the road. So the maintenance and the cost of having a railroad, you know, the money would come back in terms of profit if you could have it in use. So it was a single track because it was very expensive to delay track, but along the way there were sidings so the trains could pass each other. A northbound train could pass a southbound train and vice versa. Really pretty good because I can run multiple trains on a single track, pretty good in terms of being able to make money. This is how all railroads ran. Now, the important thing about that is you had to have sidings, obviously the trains could pass each other and you had to have accurate and very, um, sometimes very tight timetables. So the important thing about running on a single track is, yeah, you can make it work, but the trains had to be on time. You, everyone had to have a good pocket watch and you had to know where you were supposed to be on the schedule so you could get onto the siding when the train passing north or passing south could pass by you. Really important to stay on time on a, on a single track railway. And the Western and Atlantic was a single track railway. <clears throat> oh, so a couple other things. Um, it, if you think about it, the, these trains burned wood. Now, there were coal trains in that time, and there actually were some trains that burned oil already, but wood was plentifully available. You could, you could, you could um, build up a, a, a whole set of uh, small wood stops, farm stops along these rail lines and have it just basically contract with a local farmer to basically cut, split and stack wood alongside the track. And as the trains move past, they would just stop, you know, as a, you know, and sometimes there'd be a water tank, sometimes when they would refuel. So I didn't, you didn't have to have the train carry all the fuel, the engine didn't have to carry all the fuel it would take to get from Atlanta to Chattanooga or Chattanooga to Atlanta. It just had to have enough fuel to get between the stops. And the distance from going to Atlanta to Chattanooga for these trains, the one we're going to focus on, the general, was about an hour and a half. So, I mean, so, excuse me, uh, two and a half loads, two and a half loads of wood. So that's how much it would take. You know, uh, the, by the way, the train load, uh, if you if you know what a cord is, people who hit with wood know what a cord is. It would be two and a half cords of wood would be able to be put into the the basically the the, the tender that where the wood would be hauled behind the train engine. So the so on that day at 4 a.m., the Atlanta uh, uh, the General uh, pulling three box cars and two passenger cars leaves Atlanta. So it starts out in Atlanta, and the General is a it's uh, it's about six years old. It's not necessarily brand new, but it is new in terms of technology. It's really some of the latest stuff in terms of. Uh, at the time, you know, state of the art, if you want to view it as, that way uh, as an engine, uh, very efficient, well broken in. Um, uh, the, the thing about these engines, which made them sort of interesting is they had no brakes. So you can go, well, wait a minute, how could you run a train on a single track and hear the sidings and schedules and everything like that? Well, what about brakes? How do, you, how do you drive that train if there's no brakes on it? Now the individual cars had a brake, so you could like, you could, you could hold the car in place if it was on a slope. The engines themselves didn't, they didn't have any brakes. So the, what they would do is you had to have a very talented engineer who ran the engine, who knew exactly how much weight he would be carrying in terms of the passengers and the cargo and the, and the cars behind him. And he knew the railway very well, the where that track ran and its slopes and where, the, where his stops were. And so he could estimate based on his speed and the amount of weight how long that train would take to stop. So they can never really go very fast. And they, you know, they had to have some speed because they needed to get between the, 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 two, the stations where they were stopping, but they never went really fast, maybe 13, 14 miles an hour, maybe, maybe up to 20 at certain times. But the idea is because I had to be able to figure out how to estimate how long it would take me to stop that train. For effectively, I'm coasting into the station where I'm gonna stop. Now, if I had to, they had the ability to reverse the engine. So the engines could run backwards and they could reverse these big driving wheels you see there. And they could, using those wheels, use, you know, cause the engine to stop. But they didn't like to do that because, first of all, it, it wore on the engine to run those wheels backwards while it was moving forward. But secondly, it burned up fuel. You know, I had to use fuel to go backward, you know, to run the wheels backwards. It just, you know, it wasn't something I wanted to do. So the skill of the engineer wasn't just making the train go, but making it stop where it had to stop get to the siding where it had to be when another train might want to pass it, for example. So really important to have that talent. And, and the, the driver of the general uh, was good at that. He, was, he, was, he knew what he's doing. So this, the, what you see there is 
So now this is the, you know, the train is leaving 4 a.m. in Atlanta. And <clears throat> between 3 and 4 a.m. in this hotel in Marietta, Georgia, uh, it's now called the Kennesaw House. Um, but at the time, it was called uh, the, uh, it was called the, uh, the Fletcher House. Uh, now, 19 of the Raiders and Andrews are in that, are staying here. Um, he gets them up at 4 a.m. Now, two of them are in another hotel because they didn't get the message or whatever. They, either the Marietta house was, I mean, the, the Kennesaw house hotel was full or they didn't go to the right hotel. They were, at, they were in the wrong hotel. Well, <clears throat> so the 19 Raiders and Andrews meet in a, I don't know, they're in a room. I, think, I can't believe they'd be meeting in somebody's room because they'd seem to be making a lot of noise. 19 young guys walking around the middle of, you know, three or 4 a.m. But they meet in this room and there's some disagreement. So some of the older Raiders are saying, you know, we were a day late now. I mean, uh, um, because, because this time they, they had heard that, you know, that uh, Huntsville was being attacked. And of course that was Mitchell attacking Huntsville, Alabama, trying to get to Chattanooga. And they said, we're too late. You know, um, everyone's going to be on alert because they're going to, you know, they're going to be, you know, uh, they're, they're know about this invasion. They're going to, they're going to find us or they, they, we're going to get caught. And Andrew says, no, he says, no. He says, uh, this, is even, this is even better. You know, he says, even better that this happened because now they'll be looking north. They won't be expecting us to steal a train because they'll be focused on the invasion of Huntsville where Mitchell's trying to invade you know, Alabama and then get to Chattanooga. They won't be expecting us to steal a train. So it's even better. <laughs> well, whether that, that's really true or not, you know, he's sort of like, again, he was a good talker. So he managed to convince him. And he said, he, his, his quote, and this is again, uh, from Pettinger, he says, boys, I tried this once before and I failed. Now I will succeed or leave my bones in Dixie. <laughs> so he gives this dramatic speech. You know, again, if we were making a movie, there'd be like a lot of dramatic music. And he gives this very, you know, patriotic thing. And they all go, yeah, you know, they all charge out there. So anyways, they wait for the George, the, um, the general to come past and it stops at Marietta. They have tickets to get to Chattanooga and they get, they board the train in Marietta. So now the Raiders are on the train. The trains, again, the general, three box cars and two passenger cars, they're in the passenger cars at the end of the train and they're heading north. So that's where, so that you can see that the, this, using this map, you see the two, the one is where the general starts. Um, uh, William Fuller's, uh, he's the conductor on the train, we'll get to him in a minute, but they're in, they stop in Marietta and the, the you know, kind of, they look kind of weird. 19 young guys, again, they're in civilian clothes, um, get on a train in sort of like the middle of the morning, early morning. And, you know, the, and, they, and the train, you know, the general's headed north to, to Chattanooga. And you think that would rouse suspicion, but apparently what was going on is that the South was just about to start conscription. Even back in April of, of 62, I mean, 61, they were going to start the draft. And just before this, it was just before that, people knew that was coming in June. So there were a lot of young men taking trains around at the time because they were kind of go to some place where they wanted to join that particular regiment. So it was not unusual to have a bunch of young, you know, soldier age boys moving around these in these trains. So I, I guess they didn't really stick out like a sore thumb. But the, uh, Andrew said, don't talk to each other and don't sit together. That was his own <laughs> instruction. So they did. So they got on the train. And now they're in the train in, in Marietta. So they're heading to Big Shanty. If you look at the map, it's just about 15 minutes north of Marietta. Now, that's where they're going to steal the train. Why Big Shanty? What happened there? Oops. Uh, just a second. I have to, I have to come back in because I... All right. Okay. So why did Andrew, and Andrew, this is Andrew's plan, by the way, he didn't really tell every one of these Raiders what his plan was. He told them what he had to, what they had to know to, to be part of it, but he didn't tell them everything. So Big Shanty, he did tell them Big Shanty is where we're going to steal the train. Why Big Shanty? Well, Big Shanty, Georgia was a whistle stop hotel and rest and um, a breakfast place. And you can kind of see that this is gone now. This, this, this was long since burned or, or torn down. You can see that, you can see the, a, a contemporary um, drawing of, of what it, this, this whistle stop looked like. So the idea behind stopping there was, first of all, 
there was no telegraph. Now the telegraph line ran past Big Shanty, but there was no telegraph station in Big, Stan Big Shanty. And the hotel restaurant complex had been built on its own. So there was no town there. It was just basically the hotel, the whistle stop. The other thing Andrews knew is they would stop for breakfast at 5 5.20 a.m. They, you know, he, he actually knew what the schedule of the general was gonna be. And they had built a breakfast stop so that the crew could get off and eat breakfast. And of course, you know, after having breakfast and actually all the passengers could get off if they wanted to, they would get back on the train and continue north. So they built that into the schedule. So they pull into Big Shanty, Big Shanty breakfast. Breakfast was a quarter, by the way, at this place. I, I don't know if that was a lot of money in those times. I hope it was worth the quarter. But sure enough, the engineers, the conductor, and everybody who's part of that train gets off. So except, of course, the Raiders don't get off. Andrew says, okay, we're just going to stay on the train. Now they have pistols, loaded pistols, six shots. Um, I think they're Colts and Remingtons, if you know what those are. Anyway, um, he says, don't show your pistols and don't fire unless I tell you. So they sort of quietly get off the train. Now they're in the passenger cars in the back. And Andrews and two of the people who uh, have two guys who are the engineers go up to the front of the train. There's nobody in it. They're in, you know, they're in the, in the, in the cafeteria when I, or in the breakfast place having their breakfast. So they get into the cab. One of the raiders pulls the pin. This is like a pin coupler type of, of technology they had on this rail road back there in the 1860s. So between the last box, box car and the first passenger car. So disconnecting the two passenger cars that was the end of the train. The rest of the raiders quietly and carefully get into the last box car and shut the door. Now that's how the train gets stolen. So effectively, because the entire crew of the train, the conductor and the engineer and the fireman that were supposed to be responsible for that train are in having breakfast, they can basically steal it. So at that time, the fateful, the fateful morning at uh, 520, um, they, at 6 a.m., you know, just, you know, after they get organized a little bit, uh, they push the throttle forward. They move this thing called a Johnson bar. And if you know what a train works, you know what that is. But it was what allows the pistons on the driving wheels on that, those two, those four big wheels on the train to start pushing the train forward very slowly. It's not going to cause a lot of noise. And the train pulls out the station. And that's, that's it. Now, once they do that, they've got the train. Nobody else is on it. Of course, all the passengers are in the passenger cars which were unhitched and so left behind. And of course the crew is in there having breakfast. You know, they're totally oblivious to any of this going on. Now, the thing about Big Shanty, even though it was ideal for every aspect of stealing a train, one thing about it wasn't ideal. On the other side of the train tracks from where this, this hotel um, restaurant complex was, was the Georgia training camp for the entire state of Georgia. And there were, at that time, they stole this train. Now, Andrews knew this. It wasn't a surprise to him. Um, there were 6,000 soldiers in training right across the tracks within eyesight. Now, the, the picture you see shows them with these, these um, rifles and stuff like that. But they didn't have any. They weren't issued their weapons yet. In fact, they didn't even have uniforms yet, the, the soldiers in training. Um, but they didn't see them. They didn't see this guy sneak around. I mean, they were just casually moving into this boxcar. And... They didn't see really the train even pulling away. They just kind of, you know, it was like, well, train, you know, trains pass by all the time. Didn't pay any attention to me. Plus it was a Saturday morning. I mean, who, who's gonna get up at 5 a.m. Saturday morning and start you know, asking questions? Nobody. So train pulls away and now they have the general. So now they're at Big Shanty. Um, they move a little farther up the line. There's a place called Moon Station. And there happens to be a crew of rail workers working on the line. Now the line's complete, but they're, so they actually borrow a track tool. Now, uh, Andrews talks these guys into giving me, which is like a big pry bar. Think of like a, a crowbar the size of a person. And the idea they wanted that, and they really needed it because they wanted to be able to pull up tracks. So, that, so they borrow that. And then the next thing they just kind of go a little bit farther past there around the turn, if you will. And they have with them a hacksaw, the Raiders have a hacksaw, and they go up the, the, the telegraph pole line. There's a telegraph, a telegraph line that runs the entire length of the railroad, and they cut it. So they cut the line so that even though Big Shanty didn't have a, a telegraph that could alarm anybody, they wanted to be sure that nobody south of 
where they had gotten that track tool could send a telegram north, basically cut them off, basically alert someone to the north. And they kept doing this, by the way. So they, they would move along a little bit and they would, after a while they got tired of, of actually climbing these poles and cutting these lines. And they would just throw a rope up over the, the, uh, the uh, telegraph line and, and tie the rope and then just take off in the train and, and use the rope to just yank it, basically yank the line down. So they could do it pretty efficiently. So they kept going and um, they got all the way to this place called uh, uh, Edo. So, so the thing is, uh, oh, which I didn't mention is they couldn't go as fast as they wanted. You think, well, you know, we're just terrible. We push that throttle all the way forward, go as fast as we possibly can. Well, guess why? Because they're on a schedule. And if they were to have uh, been arriving to pass some of these stations before their scheduled time, the people watching them go past would have thought something's wrong. They would have gotten on a telegraph, and started sending out alarms. Like, what's going on? How come this train's ahead of where it's supposed to be? Because it would have been dangerous. Plus, there were trains headed south, and you had to make sure that they were, the, they were going to be at the right spot when the southbound trains would arrive. So they would be either on a siding or that train would be on a siding, and they could pass it. So we had to stay on schedule. That must have been excruciatingly bad because you had to stay on schedule. Now, in the meantime, <laughs> in Big Shanty, uh, there's this cry about, hey, somebody's taking your train. Now, Fuller is the conductor, Murphy uh, is uh, the engineer, and um, oops. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and Jeff Kane is the fireman. Well, they come out of the, you know, the, you know the, they of course can't believe this is really happening. So they come out of the, they didn't expect this at all. I mean, they weren't even thinking anybody would ever steal a train, much less their train. So they'll come out of the big shanty uh, you know, breakfast and they're like looking down the tracks, watching this train take off over the horizon. Uh, what they immediately do is start running after the train, running. And it's, you know, they're just running down the train track. I mean, it's hard to believe like these, you know, three guys, they were not young men, but they weren't old either. I mean, I'm assuming they were in reasonably good shape. So they didn't know what else to do. So they just ran after the train. They couldn't alert anyone because there was no telegraph in the Big Shanty office, uh, in, in Big Shanty uh, hotel restaurant complex. But also they had cut the, at this time they had actually cut the lines. So, uh, the, the Raiders had cut the lines north of Big Shanty anyway. So they, even if they had one, they couldn't get there. So they run north. Eventually they find that crew where, they, where, the, where um, Andrews had borrowed that track tool. And there's a, what they call a pole car there. A pole car is, um, it's a self-propelled rail car. And it's just basically you have it, there's a big pole and you stick the pole between the rail ties and you just push. And basically it's like a push car. You just push yourself along the, the track. So they get on that and they're running along and they finally, you know, they're moving pretty quick, but they get to a point where Andrews had stopped and they had pulled up a rail with that rail tool and they crash. So they all kind of tumble off this pole car. They get it back up on the track there. You know, it was enough, three of them are enough to lift it and they continue on. So they're, in hot pursuit. Of course, Andrews doesn't know that he's being pursued. He know, you know, he thinks, well, it could have happened, but he doesn't know it's happening. So let's go back to this. So they get to Altoona Pass. Uh, they, I mentioned this because it's a you know, geographic feature. You see that little thing where they're cutting the the phone, the the, the uh, telegraph line. But th by this time, they're just pulling the line down with a rope. And they run past this place uh, in, near Attawa, Georgia. And it's a one part of the, this rail line where there's a spur that comes off to a mine. And it just so happens to be, you know, faithfully on that Saturday morning, a train sitting there, the, the, uh, uh, the donut. I mean, so, you know, of course, Andrews didn't know this train was going to be there. And it's sitting there fully fueled, uh, the, the Yona, and it's, it's sitting there on the siding as they come past. So this is like a drawing. You can see the there's the, you know, the, that's the general and the three boxcars rolling past this. Now, again, they're not speeding. They're just going along at this, the rate they would probably normally because they don't want to draw any attention. So these guys that are sitting there, um, a part of the crew of the, the owner, just watch them go past. They're kind of thinking, how come they're, you know, that's supposed to have passenger cars on the end. Where are the passenger cars? But they don't do anything because they figure, well, you know, there's no, no alarm or anything. So um, Andrews continues on. Of course, they cut the line, the telegraph line north of this junction as well. So in case, even if they set an alarm, they wouldn't be able to send it north. Um, now, Fuller finally gets to this same junction after Andrews passes through and the Yona sitting there 
So he tells them what happened and they all get on the Yona. And of course it's, they have to back, run backwards, but they start running backwards, basically chasing down Andrews. So if the Yona hadn't been there, that part of the chase never would have happened. Fuller never would have got, you know, he wasn't gonna be able to pull, do that pole car all the way to, to catch Andrews. They would never caught him, even at, you know, the moderate speeds. Um, but once he got on the Yona, sitting there, fueled up, ready to go, the chase was on. Of course, Andrews still doesn't know any of this is happening. So here's, you know, here's a continuing north at, at five, you can see, you know, this is where, as we're progressing north, you can see that's where they, the, um, the Yona sitting there at that, that, that goes to Cooper Ironworks. That was the spur track. Andrews is continuing north. And he gets to Kingston. Now Kingston is a major rail yard uh, for the Western and Atlantic um, Railway. And this is like the hub, aside from Atlanta and Chattanooga. Uh, there's a spur that goes off to Rome, Georgia to the west. And Andrews pulls into, the, again, he's not in a hurry because he can't hurry. He cannot break the, you know, if he, if he were to uh, come flying in there or leave in a hurry, he, they would, he, you know, he, he, what he wants to do is get north of here to cut the telegraph line so they can't tell anybody north he's coming, but he can't do that either. So he gets into Kingston now. He knows there's going to be a train that's going to pass through there when he's on the siding in Kingston going south. So he's going north in the general, and the train he's going to get past is coming south. But he sees this train coming, <clears throat> and for the first time, he realizes he's in a lot of trouble because this train comes past him as it's coming south, and it's got a red flag on the front of the train. Now, what that meant was in this rail line, and Andrews knew it, that was the signal that said, following this train, the train with the red flag, is another train. And that train's not expected to be on the schedule. So don't get on the track after this train heading north because you'll, you'll hit the train behind me. So the red flag meant there was another train coming. Andrews didn't know about it. He was thinking, what train? You know, well, it turned out the second train coming behind this train, the one he expected, was coming from Huntsville because Huntsville was being invaded by Mitchell. So now he's stuck. He's stuck on his side. You can kind of see in the, if you look at the, there's a drawing of, the, of what this rail yard looks like. You can see the general is at this number, the number eight up there, the top, top, top um, right side. So that's where it's sitting. It's on a siding. Try, he wants to get onto the main line and get out of there is what he wants to do. So he's basically sort of impatiently waiting. He sees another train coming in from the north. Unfortunately, it's not a train he'd expected to see, and it also has a red flag. So now the second train comes in, which basically indicates there's a train following me. Don't get on the main line because you'll run into that train. So now he has to stick, sit there for, so now he <coughs> pulls into Kingston at 6.30. He's stuck there at 8.30, 9.30. He, he doesn't dare get on the, the line going north, first of all, because he'd get in trouble. You know, he'd, he'd alert somebody he'd getting on the line when that train with the red flag came past and said, don't get on the line. If he were to take off, they would have got on the telegraph and said he's going crazy or something, you know, this is gonna be an accident. He didn't want that to happen. So he has to wait. He's waiting. 8.30, 9.30, finally about 10 o'clock, the last train that doesn't have a red flag comes in, the last unexpected train from Huntsville. So he needs to get out of there because he didn't expect to nearly be delayed where he had been. You know, he basically he spent, he had figured they spent about an hour in Kingston. He spent there three hours. Of course, what is Fuller doing behind him coming up on the Yona? He's coming as fast as he can, trying to avoid trains on, on that are coming south, of course, but he's coming up behind him. Now, Andrews doesn't know Fuller's coming behind him. He, he doesn't suspect, you know, that they're chasing him, but he knows he's going to get in trouble if he stays here too long. So he basically goes back to the station. See how far you can kind of see where the station is on that map. He walks back down to the station. Now the track ahead is clear. There are no more trains as far as he knows. You know, there's some on the schedule, but he, he knows there's no other red flag trains coming. So the problem is the switch is set the wrong way. So the switch is set to go north-south on the main track, and he needs to have that switch changed so that he can come from the siding and get on the main line and get out of there. <clears throat> so what he does is he walks into the station and he grabs what's called the switch key. So what switch key is sort of like a way that stops from just walk up the switch and throwing it. Think of the switch as there's a big lever and you set, you know, you push it to the left or push it to the right, and that moves the track so it's either straight or turn. So, well, they, they pull a key out of there so you, you just can't walk up and do it. So once you set the switch, pull the key and go back to the station house so no one else can set it until they 
have the key to set it the other way. So he grabs the key. Now he just walks in there, grabs the key and walks out. <laughs> uh, and of course the people in the station, I was thinking, well, that's never happened before. No one's ever come and just got the key. You know, it's our station, it's our rail yard. What's this guy grabbing? So he grabs the key and he heads north. I mean, he, he walks back to the train, sticks the key in the, in the switch, throws the switch the other way and then takes the key with him. So they grab the key, switch it. So the, the siding is back down to the main line and the general takes off. So now he knows because he did that, that there is going to be an alarm. So the first thing they do, they go like maybe three or 400 yards, they pull the telegraph pole. I mean, the telegraph line down right away because they know that, that there's gonna be an alarm. And certainly there is, because in Kingston, they're thinking, what the heck just happened? You know, not only that, he took the key that they couldn't switch the, the they had to go find another key to switch the, the rail back the other way. So most of this chase actually takes place in Kingston. Three hours of the time from where it starts to the time it ends, is they're sitting in Kingston waiting for these trains to come through. So that's part of that, you know, I think it was just chase and whatever. Um, and the other thing you notice is there is no other trains involved except the Yona and the Generals. The Generals is the train they stole, the Yona is what's behind them. So the Yona finally comes up in the Kingston just as they're pulling out, just as Andrew's pulling out. He had been delayed another 20 minutes. They would have caught him right there in Kingston. But he gets out just enough and he pulls up a rail uh, unfortunately, the Yona can't get through Kingston either because the the, all the sidings are blocked. The key's gone. So Fuller gets off the Yona and tries to find another train. Now he takes one of the trains that happens to be one of the red flag trains. He says, okay, you know, this is what's going on. My train's been stolen. Um, I need, we need to go get it. So they, of course, they don't believe him at first, but then they realize, you know, they recognize who he is. And they okay, well, okay, let's just get one of these trains. We'll turn around and they head off north from Kingston. So uh, they're, they don't go very far when they find where the Raiders will pull up another track where they cut the foam. And so he doesn't get very, uh, Fuller doesn't get very far to, out of uh, Kingston because the, they basically pull up a, rail, a piece of rail so they couldn't keep pursuing him. So they get back and start running again. So they're running north. Now, <clears throat> they finally flag down a train and it's the Texas. So finally the Texas becomes part of this. So what is the Texas? How did the Texas get past with the general when the, the, the Texas is coming south and the general must have gotten past it? Well, because the general passes the Texas on a siding. So remember, you know, the idea is that the trains can pass each other if they're on the schedule. Now, at this time, Fuller had no faith. I mean, not Fuller. Um, Andrews had no faith in the schedule. I mean, it was just whatever, uh, whatever the schedule was. Um, they were really trying to go fast now because they figured, well, if we if we hit a train head on, it won't be any work. You know, we'll cause a big. We'll all we'll all jump out of the, off of this train and just before we collide, and then you know we'll make, we'll disrupt. At least we'll disrupt the train traffic. We'll destroy a couple of trains. So there's no more st sticking on any kind of schedule. They just basically let's get out of here. Let's get to Chattanooga as fast as we can. Well, he just locks out. He passes the Texas on a siding. Now the Texas, he knew the Texas would be coming south, and he goes past it. And he's, he, they're heading north, you know, fast as they can. Uh, the Texas again continues after the the general passes because they're heading south and they meet Fuller and, Mur and, and Murphy running uh, along the track and they get on the Texas and they explain to them what's going on. Um, so what happens then is they take the Texas, they back it up to that siding, unhitch all the cars. So the Texas had 20 cars behind it. <laughs> and so now they have the Texas heading backwards because they can't turn around chasing the general. So that's how this chase starts uh, at Daresville. <coughs> and here they are. This is a uh, Henry Haney and Bracken's the, uh, the engineer, Haney's the fireman, and Murphy is the conductor of the Texas. So them and, them and Fuller and, and his guys, his guys are heading north. Now there's seven of them total. I think Fuller has a shotgun, but they are not armed. So this is the other thing about this oddly. Um, here, um, Andrews and the Raiders, between them, there's 20 men. They all have pistols with six shots. And here they're being chased by these guys in the Texas that are effectively unarmed. All they had to do was stop and challenge them I and mean, they would have been able to capture them or shoot them or something, right? But of course, they don't know that. They just know that they're, they can hear a train whistle and they know there's a train in pursuit. They have no idea who's chasing them or how they even found out. Um, so they don't stop. So here's you know, the idea is he brought all these um, men with him so they could actually fight it out if they had to. But the time they probably could have was been right there and they didn't choose not to do it. They chose not to do it. So now they're, they're heading, they're both heading north. Now they're, they're both, 
going about as fast as they can. You know, you know, again, they're they're trying to watch around curves and stuff because they're concerned about running into another train. <clears throat> they would just like to avoid do that if they if they could. Um, Andrews is stopping every once in a while, but he doesn't have enough time to pull the track up because he can hear the Texas following him. So they're trying to pull the lines down just in case they try to send a telegram. Um, they get to Resaca and they actually pick up a telegraph operator, the uh, Texas does. Uh, Andrews, you know, they go right past there. Of course, they're going fast. So, um, you know, they, they, you think they would have seen them run, you know, go shooting past and set off the alarm, but they didn't. They didn't understand what was going on uh, in Resaca. So they pick up the telegraph operator out of Resaca because they said effectively, we're going to try to catch these guys and we'll drop you off. We'll chase them so they can't stop and cut the phone line, uh, cut the uh, telegraph line. We'll drop you off so you can send a signal up ahead of us. So that was the that was the plan they were making as they were chasing them. <coughs> so this is just basically happening. It's just showing a, a picture of uh, what's happening in Osaka. By the way, Andrews had no time to stop and burn anything. So I mean, they're in hot pursuit. So they drop a car, but you know, basically not, nothing happens. So. So they drop the, you know, again, there's there's three box cars when they when they steal the general, they're dropping these off as a way to sort of block the track, but but really all all they do is when you know the Texans presume they just basically just grab these cars and push them along. So they're not concerned eventually they get to a siding and then and they they'll you know they move the car off to the side so they can they can pursue the you know the, the general. So they're I mean it's kind of concerning that these cars are coming back at them, but it doesn't stop them from chasing them. So while they're doing this, now this is their estimates that they cover this distance from uh, near Kingston where the, they pick up the Texas to Tunnel Hill where they eventually um, get caught. They cover that distance, it, 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 they think they're going about 60 miles an hour. Now these trains, I mean this track is just iron rails nailed basically uh, spiked to, to wooden sleepers. I mean, and there's no, I mean the tracks aren't necessarily built for trains moving that fast, but they don't care. So the the generals is going as fast as it can, and the Texas is going as fast as it can in reverse. So the Texas is going backwards, if you want to view it that way. Um, the fortunate thing is they don't have enough fuel. You know, the problem with running an engine at that speed is it burns wood at a huge rate. You got to have that the boiler really hot to generate that much motive power to get that much steam, which is it burns wood faster. Of course, it'd be great if Andrew, Andrews and the Raiders could stop in the general and you know, put a bunch of wood in the back. And there are wood piles as they're, they're passing, but they don't have time because they think they're being pursued by you know, not just these seven guys in a trail, trail car. They think there's actually soldiers behind them. They don't know who's chasing them. If they had known, of course, they would have just stopped and said, OK, let's have it out. You know, we outnumber you like three to one. Uh, and we have guns, and you and I have one shotgun, so <laughs> that wouldn't have, you know, wouldn't have ended well for the people in the Texas. But of course, they don't know that. You know, they're being pursued, so <clears throat> they don't stop. They can't stop for wood. So they finally get to the point where they're being pursued, and they're actually pulling the box car that they last they have one more box car left, and they're pulling the the wood off the box car and throwing it into the uh, on the general, and they're throwing it into the firebox to burn that wood. And but there's not enough. They, they uh, actually th they actually soak their clothes and jackets in oil. They throw those in there, uh, but it's just not enough to keep the steam going. So basically, what happens is there's a tunnel, a tunnel hill. And you can kind of see this picture showing it. Oh, they 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 throw these railroad ties out of the back of the. You can kind of see the picture in the middle. They're throwing these railroad ties out of the back of the box car, last box car, hoping that that would stop the Texas from pursuing them. But they sort of just bounce off the tracks as they're going so fast that when these Railroad ties hit the tracks, they go flying. And so, you know, they don't really slow anybody down. And then, then they get to this tunnel. There's actually a tunnel, um, the only, the major tunnel on, on this uh, Western Atlantic Railway called Tunnel Hill. So they're figuring, well, this would be a good time to maybe do an ambush. So they're talking, you know, and the, the, the raiders on, on the tech, uh, general saying, let's stop, let's do it, let's, let's get these guys. Well, Andrew says, no, no, you know, we don't know who's behind us. Uh, we don't know if they are, you know, it could be uh, soldiers behind us or whatever. Um, in the meantime, the Texas slows down just enough. So the telegraph operator they picked up, they drop him off. And just before the Raiders can pull down a telegraph line, the last time that they stopped to do that, they get a telegraph, uh, uh, a telegram off 
to north of where the general is. So the fort there, the there is a of course uh, Bragg's forces in in Chattanooga get that telegram. This is the train stolen. Um, you got to you, you know you got to stop it. So they actually have set up an ambush uh, you know, near Chattanooga so that you know the had had the general kept going, they probably would not have they probably would have all been killed. Who knows? But um, anyways, they get through this tunnel, which would have been an ideal place. Again, I keep saying this, but it would have been an ideal place to ambush uh, the, the, the Texas that following them. Uh, they, they would have outnumbered them you know, three to one. Uh, they all had pistols. They had six shots in those pistols. But Andrew said, no, we're not going to do that. So they, they kept going. Now, eventually, north of the tunnel, not very far, like a couple of miles, the chase ends. They just basically run out of fuel. They run out of steam. You know, the, uh, the engine burns. You know, Fuel, the fuel heats the water, the water drives the pistons, the pistons move the wheels and the wheels move the engine. Well, they, it, without uh, enough steam, you can't make the engine move and effectively it just, they just stop. I mean, they just run out of fuel and they stop. So now they're just sitting there on this track. <laughs> and of course, um, uh, uh, Andrew says, uh, you know, you know, of course, the, the, the people in the Texas are a little bit worried because then why did they stop? You know, what's going on? How can they stop? But uh, just about that time, Andrew says basically, uh, you know, they get, make it 88 miles, by the way, in, in six hours. That's how far they got. Um, he says basically scatter and escape best ways you can. And he jumps off, Andrew jumps off the general and runs into the woods. And that's it. Now, the, the other 19, 19 guys with him, the way Pettinger describes this is, they kind of look at each other like, what do we do now? <laughs> so um, Andrews has a compass and a map. None of them do. So they kind of know where they are, but they don't really know where they are. So they all just scatter. I mean, they just figure, well, you know, we'll take our chances because they figure eventually, and they were right, eventually they would be caught, you know, if they stayed on the, on the rail track. And they could see the Texas slowly rolling up to them, of course, very slowly because they the people in the Texas didn't understand what was going to happen here. Um, but uh, had they continued, again, like I mentioned, they had had us. The uh, Bragg's forces in Chattanooga set up an ambush, and they had a whole company of men that would have ambushed the, the general and probably killed them all. But of course, they didn't know that it was coming. Uh, fortunately, I know some ways for them, um, they stopped. So they all kind of like head to the woods. Now it's been raining for uh, weeks. It's it's really hard for them to be tracked in the rain because there's a lot of you know water and flooded areas and stuff like that. But they're lost. They have no idea where they are. None of them have any maps. There's no. There's not even any sun to figure out like what direction is, is north, south, east, or west. And <clears throat> they were all given the same story when, when Andrews was briefing them on the meeting, and they, they said basically their the story was we're from we're looking for a we're from Flemingsburg, Kentucky, and we're looking to join a regiment. So they capture a few of them. They tell them the story, and then of course the word spreads amongst all the people pursuing them. Hey, if anybody tells you the story about Fleming in Kentucky, you know who those guys are. Those are the, you know, those are the Raiders. Get them, you know, capture them. So that's exactly what happens. They all tell the same story. They all get captured. Within about two days, they're all captured. <coughs> they don't make it very far. Um, Andrews got within about 15 miles of where um, Mitchell was, but he was captured as well. Now, for, unfortunately, had they been able to do this raid on Friday, it would have been a lot better off because Saturday, in Georgia, Saturday, uh, April 12th, was Militia Day. And what Militia Day is, is that the Georgia militia turns out for like a muster and they have like a parade or inspection or whatever. And then they head to the local watering hole. That was basically you know, what Militia Day was. Well, Saturday, April 12th was Militia Day. So all these militia were out sort of like armed in force if you want to think of it that way. And of course they could think of nothing they would want to do better than drill. So <laughs> except of course run after these spies. So all these guys were searching for them. They are basically you know, hundreds of these militiamen on the on the lookout. Of course, you know the raiders, they had pistols, but they never really, you know, they, they never really did anything with that. In fact, one of the militia uh, ends up shooting himself accidentally in the leg. That shot and that wound is the only blood drawn in this entire story. So none of the raiders, none of the raiders ever fire, ever fire a shot. The pursuers never fire a shot in anger. Even when they're being captured, they don't really even fire a shot in anger. They're all just captured, you know. They just give up because they're lost, they're wet, they don't know what to do. Um, so, anyways, that's how that's basically how they get captured. <coughs> 88 miles, six hours, 
the great locomotive chase. So let's go. So what happens? Chase, as you can see the, the picture there, they're heading for the woods. Well, they all get captured and they get thrown in this prison in Chattanooga called Swim's Prison. And Swim's Prison is actually a runaway slave um, prison where they would take runaway slaves. And whether or not this was intentional or sort of meant as a, an insult or whatever, um, regardless, the, the, the conditions were pretty terrible. They were, you know, they were, now the, uh, the two that are overslept that got caught too, by the way, because of course they gave the same story. And even though they never were part of the raid, they were eventually found out. So that now there were 22 of them in this 13 by 13, basically a hole in the floor um, there was no, of course, no sanitation in there. Their food was lowered down through a rope. And if they ever needed to get out, they would put a ladder down so they could get out. So it was pretty horrifying. And Sims I guess, was drunk most of the time anyway. Um, there were no um, windows. There was no uh, air vent or anything in this, in this basically hole in the ground. Um, and of course, they, you know, they were crowded in there, 22 of them. Um, it, was, it was just terrible. And this is, of course, as Pettinger describes this. Well, uh, this is... Uh, So of course there are lynch mobs, and what Andrews is of course captured with them, um, he says basically, "Don't show any fear. Look them in the eye. Keep your head high." This is what he tells them, you know. And of course that probably saves them because, you know, instead of like cowering, you know, they're like these spies, thieves, or whatever, and these people throwing stuff at them, um, they kind of give this sort of, you know, straightforward-looking sort of um, attitude, and it, it, pro it probably saves them. So. Uh, uh, they get court-martialed in, in Knoxville. Um, Andrews gets court-martialed first separately. Now they realize he's a civilian. He tries to tell them he's not, but you know, that they figure out that he is. Um, he's sentenced to death. And then they try seven more, one on each day. Now they try to defend themselves and the, their defense is, okay, look, we're not spies because if we were spies, why would we steal a train? And they, you know, they, have, they actually have somebody representing them, they, uh, the military tribunal, not a court like a jury, but military tribunal. And you know they kind of think well, that's actually a good argument. You know, th if they were spies, why would they be stealing a train? A spy would want to get information and not be, you know, not reveal themselves. So they well, okay, but um, and then they said, well, yeah, we're out of uniform, but a lot of people are out of uniform because you know we're just we were just we just joined our regiment. Now that wasn't true; they actually had uniforms, but we just joined our regiment. They hadn't issued us uniforms yet. In fact, they pointed to their guards in the courtroom, and which were not in uniform. <laughs> so that kind of worked. And then they said, hey, and we didn't steal that train. We commandeered it. So in, in a war, when you capture a, you know, a town or a cannon or something like that, you're not stealing the cannon, you're capturing it. We captured a train. So we didn't steal the train. We're not train thieves. Well, despite their best efforts, they were all convicted. Seven of them and Andrews. Now, why just seven? Nobody knows. It's, they probably ran out of time. And they figured, well, you know, let's get seven done. We'll get to the rest later. Um, they figure that Andrews is going to be killed because he's a civilian. They don't know they're going to be killed yet. I mean, they're condemned to death, but they figure we need to get Andrews out. So they figure uh, by this time they're put in a different uh, prison, not the hole in the ground prison. And Andrews and one of the other raiders escapes because they figured if any of us better escape, it better be Andrews because they'll kill him. They won't kill us because we're soldiers. Now they were wrong about that. But uh, so Andrews gets away. He gets recaptured immediately, so it's, you know it's not. <laughs> he doesn't even go very far. <laughs> um, uh, and on, on uh, uh, they take them all to Atlanta because the, this time, uh, all this time, um, Orm, uh, Mitchell is pushing closer and closer to Chattanooga, and they figure we better get them out of here because if they capture Chattanooga, we'll never get to Atlanta. You know, we'll, we'll be stuck here in, in Knoxville. So they they get them all to Atlanta. They get you know actually they the train that they take them to. Atlanta with is pulled by you'd guess the general the, the engine they store they stole just you know about a month before um uh Andrews gets hung on the seventh and apparently it's a very bad hanging uh uh he's a very tall man and apparently when they built the scaffold they didn't estimate the drop right and he gets you know when he when they pull the uh, trap door and he drops his feet touch the ground so they have to get two people to sort of sit on his feet and pull his neck down break his neck so that he'll, he'll die. Um, terrible, I mean, that they, they would do that, but, um, but they did, you know, so that's uh, um, what happened. Uh, apparently Fuller sees this and doesn't, he's, 
totally, uh, totally shocked. He's just horrified by that. Um, then, on, that was June 7th. June 18th, about two weeks later, they hang s- the seven other convicted raiders, not the ones that weren't convicted, just the seven they convicted. And in fact, that they botched that hanging too. You think, well, these people would know how to hang somebody. But they try to hang all six of them. Somehow the platform partially collapsed and two of them don't die. And so they have to hang them a couple hours later after they rebuild the platform. I mean, you know, pretty bad if that would happen. But, you know, that's... So what about the other 14? So that's, you know, of our of our 22 raiders. Remember, there are 20 on the in general. Two were captured that had overslept. Um, uh, what about the other raiders? Well, they're still in a prison. Now they haven't been tried yet. Um, so they're thinking, we've got to get out of here. We've got to escape because they're going to try us and kill us. I mean, as far as they knew, you know. Uh, so they, you know, so basically plot an escape and they managed to actually make it work. So eight of them escaped. There's like a wall next to where the prison, this is in Atlanta. There's a wall next to the prison where they're being held and a wooden wall. And they get to that wall and eight of them get over and they head for the countryside. And they manage to, you know, over part of the guards are doing and cause enough commotion. The guards can't chase the eight that escape, but the other six get stuck on the wall. So they basically hold their legs so they can't get over and they get recaptured. So six of them get recaptured, eight escape. Now the eight escape, they they that escape all get away. Two of them float float on barrels to the Gulf of Mexico. Hard to believe that you could do that, but they did. And then they were picked up by a blockade runner. The other six were just made their way back to um, uh, 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 Union lines. Of course, we're getting closer and closer to Atlanta all the time. But uh, they make their they make their way back, and basically they get they escape. Um, so. You know, part of this is I wanted to conclude is, is, is basically this, you know, uh, what happened to the Raiders? And this is what happened to them. So um, these are their names because I felt it was, you know, you know and their photographs. Um, they're all either had, these are all photographs that were contemporary photographs of them at the time. Um, again, there's Andrews in the upper corner there. Um, uh, where they were from, uh, you know, their, their volunteer. Now the asterisk, <clears throat> all these men were, were, um, awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. It was just passed, you know, Congress just passed that, you know, for valor and military service. And of course the highest military award that anyone could be awarded. So the ones with asterisks were not. Now, why not? That's one of the mysteries. Now, Andrews and Campbell, they were both civilians. Campbell was the guy who had the unsavory reputation. Um, you know, you're gonna see, well, they wouldn't give them a military medal because they're not part of the military. But what about Wilson and Shadrach? Why didn't they get medals? And, and I can't find anything that explains it. But they were they, these were the, the eight that were hung. So uh, Andrews and then the seven others that were convicted uh, hung in Atlanta. The ones that escaped over the fence and got away, uh, Brown, Knight, Porter, Wood, Wilson, Hawkins, Willem, and Dorsey. Of course, they all got medals of honor. Um, interesting story about this. You know, when these guys finally got back to Union lines. The war wasn't over. Now, they probably had a good story to tell, but the war was still on. Their regiment was still going. And there was nothing that said that they were somehow exempt from service. So they went back to their regiments and served the rest of the war. <laughs> Hard as that might seem to think, you think that would believe, but you know, they were certainly, like I said, they probably didn't have any trouble buying a, buying a beer anywhere local in Ohio, but the, re- the war was still on. They had signed up for the duration of the war, and so they went back to their regiments. They went back and, and served you know, the rest of the war. Um, interesting, because uh, uh, these guys, um, Brown, um, Porter, a guy named Willem, and a guy named Wood, they were captured again in Chickamauga. So they joined back to the 21st Regiment of Ohio Volunteers, fought in Chickamauga, were captured. So they were, they were raiders, escaped, captured again, escaped again. So they escaped because they, because they were concerned when they got captured a second time that they'd find out there were some of the guys that escaped the conviction of being a raider the first time and they'd be hung. They wouldn't hang a normal prisoner because you know, why would they bother? But if they found out that they were a raider, they think they would think, well, the, if, they, if they connect us to this Andrews raid, we're going to be tried as spies and we'll be killed. So they escaped the second time because they didn't want to have that suffer that face. So they actually escaped twice. <laughs> Pretty interesting. And then the following were all paroled. So this is the other odd thing. Remember, these are the six that got caught on the wall. They tried to get out of the prison. Instead of convicting them as spies or 
whatever, they paroled them. So why did they parole these guys? No one really knows. Maybe by this time, they were just tired of this whole thing and they just wanted to um, just get rid of them. They just didn't want to you know, manage them anymore. And one of them was Pettinger. The guy who writes the story is Pettinger, Corporal Pettinger. He's one of them that is exchanged. Now, his book, Daring and Suffering, Again, I recommend that book if you want to find out, first of all, about the rate of firsthand accounts. It's very accurate. But the suffering piece was two thirds of the book. And that's his experience as a prisoner being exchanged because they end up actually in Libby prison in, um, uh, in uh, Virginia, in uh, uh, Richmond, Virginia, of all places, where they're finally exchanged. Now, the guy who's got the highlighted name, Jacob Wilson Parrott, he's highlighted because he's the first soldier to ever be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. So not only was the Medal of Honor new, the Raiders were the first ones to get it, and Jacob Wilson Parrott was the first um, soldier to ever been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Now you have to ask yourself, first of all, I don't, first of all, they were, this was pretty, these guys were pretty brave to do all this stuff, but did they really deserve it? There was not even a shot fired in anger. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you have to kind of make up your mind, but you know, that was, that was the way it went. Uh, the, the, uh, they decided they would award all the Raiders a Medal of Honor, except for those two guys. Um, that's when they got half the medal. So what happens to the general? Well, it gets burned in Atlanta. It gets it goes right back into work, go right back to work um, three days later after they, they capture it. There's nothing wrong with it. It just was run at high speed for a while. Good, you know, thing. Well, it gets on a, there's on a siding in Atlanta when Atlanta's burned and the general gets burned. You can see there's a, somebody shot a cannon through the stack, uh, pretty much beat up, but it's not the end for the general. Because the raid lives on. The general gets restored. Um, now Fuller, Fuller, by the way, becomes a friend of all these guys. <laughs> He's the far right guy with his, his arm on the post. That's the conductor that pursued them. And there's members of the crew. This is an 1892 World's Fair. You can see they're getting older. Fuller's the guy standing there with his hand on the journal with to the to the front left. So Fuller's still there. Um, these are like the remaining, of course, there's few, you know, they, they eventually are dying now. So General gets restored yet again. And Fuller, you know, Fuller goes right back to work. That's the other odd thing about the story. He saves basically the train or he's responsible for making sure the Raiders get caught at least. But he gets no award. He gets, he gets an honorary captain's rank. He's not really even in the in Georgia militia, but they give him a captain's rank. And it's not till 1850, long after he's dead, that they can that the uh, Georgia General, the General Assembly of Georgia commends this, this uh, medal. They actually give it to his son, but um, so, I mean, he goes basically, he goes back to work and he has a pretty long life and he gets, you know, he gets a lot of, uh, probably a lot of accolades and stuff, but he never gets any award for doing what he did. He just basically goes back to his job. And the last reunion is, is 1906. Now this, by this time, the restored general is at Chattanooga. Um, the guys there are the last raiders. Now the last living raider, um, uh, is, is named Porter. Now Porter is one of the guys that overslept. That didn't. He wasn't on the raid. He was captured later. Porter got the Medal of Honor. And he, can you can, uh, just think about it? He oversleeps and he gets the Medal of Honor. He doesn't even part of the raid, but he ends up being the last survivor of all the raiders. Uh, and he dies in in, uh, in 1923. So this is the last reunion. They're still they still lived after this. But this is the last time they met as a group. Okay, I'm going to do a couple of things. So we're running out of time. I'm going to keep going, Bailey, if it's okay with you. Um, first of all, there's a movie called The General, and you can see this uh, this movie on YouTube if you'd like to see it. You can just go on the YouTube and, and there's actually another movie called The General. You have to say Buster Keaton, The General, and you can watch this whole movie. It is a silent movie, um, and is considered one of the five, uh, actually top 10 silent movies ever made. And I don't know silent movies that, well, I'm not a movie kind of sure, but it is a really good movie. Now it has a general, it has a Texas, and there's two locomotive chases in it. And it takes place during the Civil War. Aside from that, there's nothing factual or anything about this movie that has anything to do with anything I just described. It's just, you know, basically it's a, it's a silent movie somewhat slapped it, slap comic. Now, uh, the, the big picture you see there is there's a train wreck in this movie. And that train wreck is a real train and a real bridge and they use dynamite to blow the bridge up and, and, and basically crash the train into the river. That train sat in that river for like 50 years until they finally they deemed it a hazard and they 
had to clean it up. So it's a real train, really crashed. There's no CGI or special effects. It's a real train. And you can kind of see these guys on the horses. Um, there were five, this was filmed in Oregon and there are 500 members of the Oregon National Guard who were the extras, played Union and Confederate soldiers. They just switched uniforms when they needed to have, have them uh, switch sides. And you can see um, Buster Keaton is, is the guy. And you can see he's, he's stuck in his head in that cannon, which is actually lit, it's hard to see and it is lit. Um, the reason this movie was so great is they filmed it from uh, uh, moving cars and a moving rail car. So they had tracks that would run in parallel. And so they would be on one, really basically on one train filming another train where the action was taking place. Just phenomenal. Now you see uh, he's sitting on a bomb in that lower uh, right corner. And that is pretty apt because the movie was an absolute bomb. He's, uh, Buster uses his own money to make this movie. And it was very expensive, um, over half a million dollars to make it. At that time, that was a lot of money. Um, it just was a box office bomb. And the reason was is because he portrayed a Confederate soldier. And he, so people in the North, and there were still people alive that knew people, and this is 1926 when this movie was released. There were still people alive that knew people that fought in the Civil War. They didn't appreciate being, you know, having the story told uh, uh, from the point of uh, the South. And of course, he, he, as a, he wins in the end, of course, because he, he, you know, he gets his love of his life and his train back. Uh, they didn't appreciate that in North. They thought that, you know, you know we won the war. What are you, you know, giving us the story? There's nothing funny about it. Well, the Confederates didn't like the story because he plays them as like a slapstick sort of clown guy. And they didn't like that either. They didn't think that was very, a very uh, nice thing that, you know, they were, you know, yeah, there were people in the, in the South who knew people who were actually Confederate soldiers. So I'm gonna just play a segment of this. So you can get an idea about what it's like. Uh, again, you can see this on YouTube and it is great. It is a, actually a really good movie. Um, very realistic. So again, all filmed in Oregon. Western Atlantic Railroad, you can see W-N-A-R-R. -R. That's Annabelle, she's getting kidnapped. It's hard to explain the whole plot. You have to watch it, I'm not gonna explain the whole plot. Annabelle is, Johnny Gray is, is the guy. There, there he is, Buster Keaton. Somebody's stealing the train. His hands are all soapy and now they're all clean. <laughs> Let's go, and he, he's uh, kind of playing the role of an engineer and Fuller all at once, I suppose. Of course, it's like, well, where's he going? No, he's never gonna catch that train. So you can kind of get an idea. It's, it might be a little choppy because of uh, the bandwidth, but you kind of get an idea about how this works. This is actually great. There's a lot of detail in this movie. You can see there's the uh, members of the uh, Oregon National Guard dressed in the Confederate uniforms. Uh, he forgets to attach the train to their placard, unfortunately. And here he is. Uh, Plenty of wood in that, that train. He's in the Texas now, in pursuit of the general. And here's the general, the, the, the train thieves. Uh, they're showing in uniform here. Of course, they didn't have uniforms in the real story, but um, and now they, you know, they're this is the they're trying to get away from him in the uh, Texas. So they were putting water in there and forgot, did nobody turn the water on. And there we go. So that's what happens if you don't turn the water on. Well, you get the idea. <laughs> uh, it's 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 a funny movie. If people, you know, want to, if you, someone says, "What were um, silent movies like?" Uh, well, they were not this good, but it's a great movie. Um, it really is, and I highly recommend it. You can see it again for free on on YouTube. So just find it on YouTube and, and get your get your popcorn out and watch the whole thing. Well, the next movie is uh, that was part of the the locomotive chase was how the this is how the great locomotive chase got its name. Well, Walt Disney movie in 1956, uh, Color by Technicolor. Now, I saw this movie on the Wonderful World of Color. I remember that was on Sunday nights at seven. And you guys, I don't know if you guys remember that, but Sunday night at seven, the Wonderful World of Disney, a Carousel of Color would come on. Well, this was one of the the, the shows they showed on that movie. And here are the stars, and you, uh, you kind of see some of them. Um, uh, Fuller, uh, not Fuller. Uh, Fuller is played. Let me get this. Fuller's played by Jeffrey Hunter. That's the guy with the mustache in the in the in the lower lower right corner. Um, uh, 
uh, Andrews is played by Daniel, I mean, the guy who played Daniel Boone, which is a Fess Parker. Um, and actually, Fess actually managed, they actually work a couple songs and they actually sing a couple songs in this movie. So that's really pretty good. Um, now, two things about this movie there. Uh, first of all is um, it, nobody knows this because it's kind of like one of these Star Trek fan facts. Um, Jeffrey Hunter goes on to play the captain in the original Star Trek pilot. So he's not, not Captain Kirk, he's Captain Pike. Um, now that pilot never airs until 1988. They find it, they piece it together and it never, it never made, it never was actually shown on television, but he was actually the original captain of the Star Trek captains, Jeffrey Hunter. Um, of course, we know uh, Andrews Fess Parker, he was also in the, the movie, Davy Crockett. Um, he, he actually, it was in another Disney movie, um, and on the popular TV show, Daniel Boone, which is how I knew him. He was like Daniel Boone. It was Daniel Boone. There was nobody but Fess Parker with Daniel Boone. Now, the other thing about this movie was quite controversial in Southern Ohio. Why? Because the middle picture there, the guy who's playing Pettinger, and Pettinger was played by a guy named John Lupton, who's in actually a couple, a couple of different movies, that never was a big star. They show him getting the Medal of Honor from Seward, the guy in the beard, and they show him getting the Medal of Honor first. And that's, that caused quite a big stir in Southern Ohio. Why? Because as I told you, the first guy to get the Medal of Honor was not Pettinger. It was a guy named Jacob Wilson Parrott. And he is the first to work. And here Disney goes and shows um, Pettinger. You can tell he's Pettinger because he has got his glasses on. Um, he shows Pettinger as being the guy getting the first Medal of Honor, which not, did not happen. And they were quite upset. There's still apparently a lot of relatives of of um, a parrot that were alive at the time in Southern Ohio. And this was controversial. I mean, they were ready to, they sued Disney in fact for that. And they, they, they wanted to print a uh, statement that, um, you know, Pettinger wasn't the first recipient. The parrot was, so uh, somebody cared and he, they got it wrong. So somebody should have known that, but they got it wrong. And this is just showing where they're filming it. Um, uh, <clears throat> it was filmed in, in uh, Georgia of all places, Georgia and North Carolina, there was a Rail, rail line was about to be abandoned and they still had running some running engines and Disney, they found out about this and they filmed it there. And that's what makes this movie really great. It has a lot of original equipment, rail wall ties and rolling stock and engines that were the original engines from the 1860s still running. Um, you can see Disney there, he's in that big photograph. Um, apparently he showed up on the set and they lost two weeks where he just drove these engines around <laughs> for another reason that he just wanted to do it. So. Um, and in the insert in the lower right, in the Baltimore and Ohio Museum, two of the engines that were used in the filming of this um, mo Disney movie are in the Baltimore and Ohio Museum in Baltimore. If you want to see them, you can see them there. The beautiful shape. Um, in fact, one of these engines, if you remember the movie Gods and Generals, one of these engines appeared in Gods and Generals. So the same engine that was in the Great Locomotive Chase, I think it played in General, also appears in Gods and Generals, of all things. So there you go, a little bit of a roundabout story there. Go, go on, just a short little bit of that, this movie. This movie is not generally available. It's still, um, you can still buy it though. It's uh, still under copyright. You can see the equipment, how authentic all this stuff was. The box cars, the, uh, now these were actually oil burning engines. I don't know what's going on with this guy's eyebrows, but it's kind of weird. There's Fess Parker. Bring your coats, boys. You, know, you don't want to leave your coats around. So you can kind of get an idea about how this, this movie, it's actually a pretty good movie. I'd say much more, much more accurate than Buster Keaton's movie, obviously. Uh, they did take a couple liberties um, with the facts, but you think, you know, it's a pretty good movie. And you see how they pins, you know, pins and link, pin couplers. So they actually use pin couplers on this rail line. Again, not the general. This is, this is uh, one of the other engines that was, you can see how, Kind of decrepit some of the track look because they're about to tear this track. This rail, this rail line's gone today. You see, the, you see the how how grown, overgrown it is. So there you go. You get the idea um, on that. Again, I highly recommend it. Now, this movie uh, was as good as it was because of this guy, and I have to call out this guy. Uh, this guy. Um, uh, his name is Kurtz, um, and um, William Kurtz, and you know, he, the reason I have to call him out is because all the drawings and paintings I use in this presentation are his. 
So you can kind of see the painting behind him. I use actually use that painting. Um, you see, he's shown there with a model of the general um, that he actually constructed and built himself. <coughs> um, he was actually from Illinois, but but moved to Atlanta and became a basic a, a history buff. Uh, was responsible for the restoration of the original psychorama that was in Grant Park in downtown Atlanta. So if you had visited that in its original place, he was the one that restored that painting. And he restored the Texas of all things that was under that painting. So again, so what, just showing like how, how amazing, he's just a master of detail. He, he didn't just draw these paintings, but he actually used original sources and made sure they were accurate in every degree. Um, the other thing was that, um, Apparently, Pettinger had taken photographs of some of this stuff after the war. Pettinger went down after the war, after he had wrote his, his and published his, his book, Daring and Suffering. Pettinger went down and took some photographs, and Fuller somehow got those photographs. Well, uh, I mean, uh, Schultz uh, almost got those photographs as well. So he was the technical advisor on Gone with the Wind. That was part of also, besides, because he was known as like a local person to that area of Georgia that you know they could rely on. And the other thing about it is um, he designed Tara. That wasn't a real, I'd I say this, but it wasn't a real um, uh, place. Tara, Tara wasn't, there was no plantation called Tara. He designed that set. So he designed Tara for Gone with the Wind. And he was the advisor in the Great Locomotive Chase, which is one of the reasons it looks so good, is he tried to make sure that they were following historical accuracy. So a shout out to, to Kurtz, because without him, I wouldn't have the drawings and we wouldn't have that movie. So what happens to the Texas in general? The Texas becomes a logging engine. You can kind of see it looks a little different. It's kind of decrepit. Um, uh, Kurtz finds it and restores it and sticks it underneath the psychorama in, in um, Atlanta, in Grant Park, where I see it in 1969. I see this, the Texas for the first time. Now, I remember at the time, could not figure out why there was a train called Texas underneath the psychorama in Georgia, but there it was. I didn't understand the story. Now, the other picture you see is uh, in the centennial celebration of the Civil War in 1862, the general is restored so it can run under its own power and becomes an, uh, an ambassador that moves all over the entire country, uh, very celebrated. Now, I didn't see it. it was this, this is 1862. I was quite young, but um, under its own power. So it's restored to where it can actually, it's now a, it, it was now a, an oil burning engine. Um, and it had, they gave it brakes. It had to have brakes to run on the rail line. But um, it could. It was actually a, a, a mobile ambassador for the Centennial. It's actually a very inspiring story. Well, <clears throat> the cyclorama in Grant Park in downtown Atlanta gets shut down. It's there's a new building now. It was open in fall of 2018. I was there last summer. Um, a new cyclorama, and of course, my question was, what happened to the Texas that was underneath the cyclorama in Grant Park? Well, that got restored, and here it is. Um, you know, it's beautifully restored. It's it's just, just awesome. I mean, a great engine and, and, and just in every detail. I mean, it, I don't know if this is actually how it looked, but they say this is how it looked um, during the great chase, but um, it's just in beautiful shape. And there I am uh, next to it. And this is in the, it's not under the cyclorama anymore. It's to the side of it, but it's at the same location as the cyclorama. So they kept the Texas and they restored it. And it's not, you can now see it if you go see the cyclorama in Atlanta. What happened to the general? Well, it, you know, it got sort of stuck in Chattanooga for a while after it was an ambassador. Um, Georgia claimed the general uh, and they wanted it back. And the governor of Tennessee said, no, you know, possession being nine tenths of the law, we have it in Chattanooga, you're not getting it back. So they actually tried to move the engine and the governor blocked the tracks with state, with state uh, the, the Tennessee State Patrol wouldn't let the engine leave Chattanooga. So it went all the way to the Supreme Court, which decided effectively that, yes, indeed, the Georgia owned it. And what happened is they acquired some land um, near, in Kennesaw, Georgia, and built a museum uh, where the generals housed. Now it's the Southern Civil War Museum and Locomotive, Southern, Southern Civil War and Locomotive History Museum. Um, the reason it's locomotive history is the land they built this on was actually a locomotive plant. And part of the museum is the plant. You can tour like where they built steam engines. Pretty cool, I thought it was pretty cool, but you know. So what does it look like? Well, there it is. General was restored as well. Um, it's in, that, in this museum, you can get up pretty darn close to it. Again, in beautiful shape. And, and of course, you know, if you know the history and you know what happened in this chase, it's, it's thrilling to be that close to that. The original general rebuilt um, 
you know, after it's all of its history uh, and all the names of the Raiders are around it and, uh, and their stories have like a little byline of all the Raiders um, and Fuller and, and his crew as well. And there I am. You can see them both on the same day if you plan your day out right. They're about, uh, I'm, 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 when the traffic's good, it, they're about uh, maybe 30 minutes apart. So they aren't in the same building. Uh, one's in, in Kennesaw um, and one's in, in downtown, near downtown Atlanta. But you can see them both on the same day. So if you are interested, and I hope you are, I hope I piqued your interest, you'll, you'll visit both the, the Texas and the general. And the last thing I want to cover is, um, well, what happened to uh, the Raiders that were hung? Um, <clears throat> if you go to the uh, National Cemetery in Chattanooga, Tennessee, there's over 50,000 headstones. And it's, it's pretty sobering, by the way. It's very sobering. Um, if you drive into the main entrance, you can't miss it right there to the right, you know, right there at the main entrance. There's a little place you can pull off and there's this memorial. And there's a, a bronze uh, model of the general on top. Uh, the raiders that were hung are on the front and then the ones that were escaped or paroled are on either end of it. Um, this was actually put up by uh, uh, some people in Ohio, they actually built this. And they uh, moved the bodies of the seven uh, soldiers that were, um, the, the two civilians and the, and the six soldiers were hung and they're buried right behind the, you can see there I am, uh, we can see the headstones around the base of that monument and there's um, Andrew's headstone. So we'll leave Andrew's and he'll have the last word is, uh, I'll leave my bone, uh, I'll succeed to leave my bones in Dixie is his quote and, and there he is, uh, his bones in Dixie. And that's my conclusion, here we go. So we can unmute if you have questions or if you want to ask something. Uh, yes, Mr. Romano, uh, Terry Davis, uh, one Cleveland native to another, except my Cleveland is Cleveland, Minnesota. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> uh, <no. laughs> um, I didn't have a question. Uh, uh, you talked a lot about, you know, they ran out of fuel, but were they able to take on water? Because that would have been needed too. The water, they, you know, they they would have ran out of water as well. They were they were able to make one stop. And I kind of skipped over that because I was falling behind. But they were able to make one fuel and water stop, just about uh, just before they got to um, uh, the, the 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 juncture, the place where they got stuck, just before they got to Kingston. So they actually were able to refuel and get water once, but that was the only time. Now they actually made a couple stops along the way and they did pick up fuel, but they just couldn't get enough. And despite there being, uh, you know, 20 of them, some of them desperately throwing, you know, logs onto the back of that thing, they just couldn't load it fast enough because they were, you know, they were so close in, in pursuit that, you know, they could hear them coming because they were blowing the whistle, you know, as they were, as the Texas was coming behind them. So they, they did get fuel on the way. They just couldn't possibly get enough for a fuel for the rate that they had to burn it to go that fast. They just couldn't, you know, they just couldn't uh, get enough fuel, you know. So yeah, they tried, but, uh, and they did have enough water to get as far as it did. Another question on, uh, I, I know during the Civil War, uh, railroads were all types of gauges. Uh, do you know what gauge the Western Atlantic? Was that a five was, foot gauge? Which was, it, yeah, the standard, or we call it the British gauge. It was like six feet six inches and a quarter, I can't remember what the, it, it's the, you know, the Roman chariot wheels width or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, uh, the Western Atlantic was standard, but you're absolutely right. There were two railroads. The infamous one was the one that went to Richmond, had a different gauge than the rest yeah. of the Southern railroads. So there was no way you could run a basic a train from Atlanta to Richmond anyway. You had to stop and unload everything. And so, of course, the place where they reloaded, they rated that all the time <laughs> to make sure right. Music. But it was sort of frustrating. But there are there are a lot of different rails, a lot of different gauges. But as I, you know, good point because I looked that up. On um, the Western Atlantic was so-called standard gauge. So it didn't, yeah, and the South had more had more gauge diversity than the they North. They absolutely did, right? Because they got their engines from different places. In the North, almost all the engines came out of New Jersey or Baltimore. There were like three major companies that built on the engines. And of course, if you're building engines, you build them all the same gauge. Why would you build different gauges? So. I remember seeing the Ohio Monument uh, that you have up there from a train. Huh. We, rode, we rode the train from the Tennessee Valley Museum down uh, through Chickamauga, Georgia to I think the town is Somerville. Yeah. Actually, we've been on that train twice. Uh, goes right past the west side of the battlefield. 
when you when you go to Chattanooga and you you know you, you go up on top of the mountain there where they had the battle above the clouds, you can see the cemetery. I mean, it is that big. I mean, you can't miss it. it yeah. It's just sobering how many people. And part of the reason that's true, by the way, why fifty thousand? Well, there wasn't any giant battles there, but that was a hospital stop for both sides at different parts of the war. And so a lot of soldiers that were wounded in battles were taken to Chattanooga, put into a hospital and then died there. I mean, they just never, they never recovered from their wounds. And of course they were buried locally. So that's why 50,000 graves, not because there was a battle with 50,000 casualties. My great, great uncle's at the Nashville National Cemetery. Oh yeah, that's also big. He was with the fourth Minnesota, no second Minnesota, I take that back, at Chickamauga. I take a model, yeah. yeah. Um, just one other question. You, you talked about locomotive chases. This wasn't a wartime chase, but in the early 1900s, uh, this chase happened every day. Uh, the New York Central and the Pensy Railroad were side by side coming out of Chicago. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the 20th Century Limited, and I can't remember the other one, but they basically raced out of the station yeah. heading east at the same time at 60, 70 miles an hour. Yeah. across southern Chicago into Indiana. Yeah. I mean, when they when they stopped, finally, they described the general's wheels as glowing red. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And 60 miles an hour was very fast in that, those days for those locomotives. It, yeah, and it's surprising they didn't just fly off the rails because they weren't, I mean, those rails were hammered down with spikes, but, you know, it was just like pieces of wood and like, like I can't remember any spikes in a rail. I mean, if, had they been loose or anything, they would have gone flying off the track. And they would have been killed. I mean, they would have been killed 60 miles an hour. So, <laughs> pretty you talk about You talked about Walt Disney. He was a huge rail fan and yeah. a model That's railroad cool. enthusiast. Yeah, yeah. Disney World was kind of a rail layout that went got away from them. <laughs> right. <laughs> Great questions. Thank you. George? Anybody else questions? George? Okay. Yeah. Uh, who made the decision they hanged them? Hold it. It wasn't indeed a military raid. That would have been contrary to military law. Well, but this is this thing about spies. So they were convicted as spies and they were convicted to hang the spies. I want to make sure that's clear. They were convicted, they were tried and convicted in a, in a military tribunal and sentenced to hang as spies. So it wasn't that that was accidental or a panic or something like that. But, you know, again, they defended themselves the best they could. They said, and they, in a way, weren't spies. They really weren't. If you think about what a spy was, you would sort of go into some, you know, enemy territory, you would reconnoiter, get information, and then sneak back. I mean, you were basically trying to get, you know, they didn't do that. <laughs> there was nothing about this mission that had anything to do with spying. In fact, they said so. Uh, you know, an interesting, an interesting byline is that Carlos Buell, after the war, he survived the war, in his memoirs, he wrote about Andrews and said he was basically a good-for-nothing so-and-so and... -so and uh, he, he gave, yeah, he, he, he sold information that was never accurate. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, he didn't have any really good thing, but you think, okay, if that's true, Mr. Carlos Buell, how come you sent him to Mitchell? <laughs> if he was so terrible, what was the deal about sending him to Mitchell to do this mission? But anyways, that was, you know, that was a little anecdote I, I learned as research, trying to research Andrews, that Buell said he was a, basically, a, you know, a charlatan. <laughs> a lot of people would call uh, Buell uh a general of uh, same quality. Yeah, he didn't have it. He wasn't very, <laughs> wasn't very good. <laughs> Great questions, guys. What else do you want to know? You'd like to know more about? Well, I, I guess the question I had was knowing that they're heading north towards uh, Chattanooga. Um, I, I don't know if they actually ever planned their end game. What if they had actually made a Chattanooga and that was a huge Confederate base? So yeah, so this <laughs> this only would have worked. This in fact, that's you know, when they had this discussion where they were trying to back out in, you know, in Marietta um, at the hotel, um, that was one of the 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 staff sergeant was which was the oldest guy and basically the and you know, the, the opposition leader said exactly that. So we don't have a chance because. By the time we get to Chattanooga, even if they haven't invaded, the Union Army hadn't gotten there yet, it's going to be an armed camp. We won't, you know, what, is, what are they going to do with us? You know, we'll never make it. So the original plan was they were going to steal the train on the same day that the attack occurred. Somehow in the confusion, effectively here, I mean, Andrew's plan was get to Chattanooga, hang a left. <laughs> that was what his plan was. Honest to God, that was what his plan was. Um, you know, basically, you set the switches so I could head basically towards 
and they didn't have to go real far, by the way, because they were, because um, uh, Mitchell was only like about 12 miles out of Chattanooga. It wasn't like they had to go that far, but they still had to get that far. They had still to get there. And there was, you're right, you know, you question how the heck they would have got through that because it was a big rail yard with a lot of trains, you know, and they couldn't go fast. I mean, <laughs> you know, they had to like set switches and you, know, they, they, you think how the heck was this ever going to work? But had they been able to abandon the train in the city of Chattanooga, they would have been a lot better off than abandoning it where they were, which was they were totally lost. I mean, they had no clue. I mean, they didn't, you know, it was like someone would pick you up and put you in the middle of, of Georgia, you know, on a rainy day and say, you know, have at it. We, where are you? You don't have any idea. They had no idea where they were. So they just basically were captured. <laughs> Some of them just gave up. They just said, you know, I can't, I, I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm giving up. You know, the railroad tracks in that area, I think the track there on comes in from the Southeast, so it's not the same track I rode down through. It's it's Chikmagua. a track. It follows the same line. Like in fact, Tunnel Hill, the yeah. tunnel is still there, but there's yeah. a new tunnel, and that's the tunnel you'd pass through if you're on a on a rail line now. Yeah, where um, Sherman attacked. That was the hill he attacked. Right, where a that, year later. Yeah, where the general is in that museum. The rail, the original rail lines, was moved. It's it's still live. I mean, it's still there's still working trains there, but the original rail line is like about it's like about fifty feet. There's a sign that shows you where it was. It's about 50 feet from where the existing, I mean, the, the current modern rail line is. So it's close to the same place, but not exactly the same rail line. It's, it's completely different. Yeah, I, I know there's like a, a very busy Norfolk Southern line right next to the, that museum that's kind of yeah. east side of town. Something I, I, I regret not saying, now you think a museum called the Southern Museum of the Civil War um, would be somehow biased or... I don't know what you would think. I mean, I, I certainly thought that. It was in no way that at all. It was very, it's not very big, but very accurate. Some really interesting artifacts. Um, tells the story of slavery, tells the story of, you know, why a rebel flag would be considered to be, you know, basically like a Nazi flag. I mean, you know, they did sell rebel flags in the gift shop, but, but um, you know, they, they were very, it was very good. I, I was quite impressed. Again, not a very big museum, but a very good museum, had a lot of you know, armaments and stuff like that. Um, there's two of the medals of honor that were awarded to the Raiders are in the museum. They must have done, their family must have donated them. Um, there's like a little bio, you know, a photograph and biography. There's a movie you can watch that uses, by the way, the footage from the Disney movie. I don't know how they got that, but they use the footage from the Disney movie to tell the story of you know, the capture and, and the, the case. So it's a great little museum, worthwhile to, to see the general, but worthwhile just to go and see what what's there definitely go to the north and Kennesaw and there's also Kennesaw Mountain Kennesaw Mountain National Battlefield you can visit when you're near Kennesaw it's not too far it's only a, a 15 minutes away from that museum George at the, in 1862 well the story the story really well known it would have been a relatively minor incident in contrast to Shiloh or anything well else. you know they, they this is part of this thing about Weren't they like heroes? Weren't they? Uh, you know, why did they join their regiments? Weren't, didn't they have like a parade or something? Now they did meet Seward and he did, not Lincoln, but Seward awarded them the Congressional Medals of Honor. I mean, he, he pinned them on. Um, now some of them, and fortunately now who, who knows what would have happened, but Pettinger does get paroled and he is mustered out of the army. So that's the reason he's able to write his memoirs because in 1863, by the time he gets back to where he lives in Ohio, um, his job's gone. He's, you know, he he's worse, much the worse for wear for being a prisoner, but it, so much so that he can't serve anymore. So I don't know exactly what happens to them, to him, but he he wasn't able to continue to serve as a soldier. So they mustered him out. So he had a jump start on writing his memoirs because he actually published that book in 1863. So the war had not been over yet. He he published Daring and Suffering. So that's why it's also viewed as a the effectively the reference for this because. He published it so soon after all the events occurred that it's very accurate. It's just very, very good. So I love that book. It, if you want to know what it's like to have been a prisoner and exchanged in the Civil War, that would be a good book to read because he it's a first firsthand brutal account, very brutal. I mean, it's horrifying with bad conditions, but he survived and they all survived. They all made it out, except for the ones that were hung. I take it you've been to Chickamauga Battlefield. Yeah, yeah. I, I love. I was there when I was a kid. I, used to go. <laughs> I love that. It's it's so undeveloped. It's yep. uh, 
um, you know, other than interpretive things there, it, it's very, yeah. you know, no, that, you can that, really see what it looked like. The state highway used to go through that and it still does, but they built a big four lane bypass that goes around it now. So you don't even have to worry about, you know, traffic on the highway. No. When I was a kid, you had to worry about traffic coming through the highway. But right. yeah, that's a great battlefield. Lookout Mountain's a great battlefield. I mean, it really is. Kennesaw Mountain's a great battlefield. Except for the cyclorama, Atlanta is a terrible place. There's nothing yeah. like it's obliterated. Right. It's been bulldozed right. three or four times by now. But yeah. um, the cyclorama is stunning. It is stunning. Mm -hmm. uh, did you know, here's a piece of trivia, that was actually painted in Milwaukee, that oh. painting. And it was actually displayed for three years in St. Paul. So I didn't know um, that. It, it, it's it's uh, the story of the cyclorama, the painting itself, and how they restored it, and what it looks like. Because you, you can tour around behind it. You can see actually behind it now. Um, it's just a fascinating story worth the just if you like art and you like paintings and the history of art and stuff like that it's a great museum to visit for that reason alone mm -hmm. so highly recommend it it's kind of traffic's bad there but you gotta you, know, you pick your traffic and you'll, you'll do okay have you ever been to the perryville i've been to perryville yeah that's that's a neat little battlefield smaller but looks just like it did beautifully preserved beautifully yeah. preserved you can squint your eyes and you can just see what, what happened that's yeah. another great place too george i agree with your comments on the museums down south the first time i was in the deep south was in the very early 70s when well, we were just barely got over the civil rights movement and they the people in the Addison's Neal were really anti-north anti-yankee very but the last time we were, my wife and i were there just a year ago we traveled all the way through Mississippi and all the battlefields. And I got to see the museum and everything we saw were very objective, very fair handed. None of this old deep cow. Absolutely. Really Absolutely. Won. I would agree 100% with what you're saying. I was, I don't know why I was so surprised, but I was. And not only that, I talked to the, there wasn't anybody there uh, when I when I went to see the general. So I talked to the, the guy who was taking the tickets. He was also running the, the, uh, the souvenir store, store or whatever, um, he said that by far more people visit that museum that are from what he would say the north than from the south. He said it's we get far more people coming here to see the general that are, we said Yankees, than people who are from this area. They don't, said so people in this area don't really much care anymore, but people, you know, that there are historians and stuff who really like this stuff. These are mostly from the north. They're people from Ohio and Indiana, a lot of people from Ohio because. There are places in Ohio that mark the birthplaces of all these raiders that got the first these Medal of Honors. I mean, that's not a joke there. <laughs> you know, it's a big deal. So uh, you know, they, they're still, and they all came from a part of the, this the, this part of Ohio near Cincinnati. All those raiders did. So there's all, still a lot of people that you know, they have a, they have parades and stuff like that. So it's a it's still a big deal there in Ohio. He said a lot of people from coming to Ohio to visit the general. All all a lot of people. So pretty cool. Well, thank you, George. I found it very interesting. Well, I'm glad you liked it. I hope that hope that uh, Bailey invites me back. And I'm sorry it went so long, but uh, it's a good story, and I just didn't want to cut anything out of it. It's a little bit difficult for me to maneuver some of the stuff. But I uh, appreciate your attention, and, and I hope that uh, hope we all uh, hope we all meet again. That would be a great thing. So, thank you, George. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Um, the session was recorded. And so I'm going to try and get it out to the rest of the membership when, as soon as I can. Um, yeah, like I said, like I said in the beginning, just watch your emails for future updates about where and how <laughs> we'll be hosting future roundtables. Um, yeah, and, and just shoot me an email if you have any questions. Or if you have any suggestions for speakers, like I said, our 2021 schedule is currently in flux. Yeah, so. and like I said earlier, just feel feel free to put me on the schedule. I'll come. I have a, quite a few presentations. And I'll come up with something. Yeah, I'll probably send you an email. Um, okay. Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> Very good. Awesome. All right then. Well, thank you. I am going to end the meeting. Thank you all so much for attending. See you next time. All right. Talk to you guys later. See you soon. <laughs>